Hey, my name is Chris Brennan, and you're listening to the Astrology Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be talking about the astrological forecast for the entire month of August of 2022. Joining me today are astrologers Austin Kopic and special guest co-host Nick Dagan Best. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Hey. All right. Um, Nick, this is your first time joining me for joining us for a forecast episode. I'm pretty excited. This will actually be your third uh, episode of the Astrology Podcast this month after your visit to Denver and technically fourth because we also did a casual astrology podcast and we packed a lot in on your visit. We sure did. Uh, thanks for having me back. Yeah, I thought this would be a good month since we're going to be talking about the Mars-Uranus conjunction a lot, which we have right at the top of the month. Um, all right, and then I want to welcome you, Austin. I just remember I want to show also the um, image for those watching the very beginning of the YouTube video, just to give an overview of what we're going to be talking about, and then we'll come back to introductions. So here is the um, astrological alignments calendar for August. It gives kind of an overview of the main planetary ingresses, lunations, and retrograde stations during the course of the month. So uh, right at the top of the month, we have a Mars-Uranus conjunction that's going to take place in the sign of Taurus, conjunct the North Node simultaneously. Then after that, a few days later, Mercury will ingress into Virgo on the sign on the day of the 4th of August. Then the following week on the same day, Venus moves into Leo. We also have a full moon in the sign of Aquarius. Then the following week, Mars ingresses into the sign of Gemini on the 20th of August, and that's actually the sign that it's going to stay in for the next six or seven months or so, because Mars is actually going to go retrograde in that sign later this year. So that's actually the beginning of a very long-term transit that's going to characterize much of 2020, the rest of 2022. Then on the 22nd, the sun goes into Virgo. Then on the 24th, Uranus will station retrograde in the sign of Taurus. The following day, Mercury moves into Libra. And then finally, at the very end of the month, on the 27th, we have a new moon in the sign of Virgo. So those are some of our main uh, astrological alignments we're going to be talking about this month. Uh, Austin, how's it going? How are you doing this month? Oh, pretty good. Pretty um, good? Yeah. Um, no complaints. Uh, can we talk Which I about suppose is the... more of a mood than a, a statement of fact. Yeah, I mean that's a pretty good mood to be in. Honestly, in my in my book, uh, can we talk about the elephant in the room, or should I say the the peacock in the room for the video viewers? <laughs> yeah, you're enjoying the, just take it all in, take in the uh, the background. Um, I, it's good, I like it. but um, you know, if you look at the 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 photo that I sent you via text, the the pink actually like it, it's like bioluminescent pink when you have the right lighting on it. And I'm a little sad it's not showing up that way. We'll have to fuck with the lighting. Yeah, we'll have to get you some like black lights or something that could be like glowing black, like um, techno peacocks. Um, for those listening to the audio version, Austin has a new background. He's moved to a different room and has a beautiful uh, floral peacock pattern in the background that's very fitting, but a little bit of a departure from your previous image that was on the background that was uh, haunting the background sort of menacingly. Yeah, it's true. Well, but you know, you got to remember that these are peacocks of war, Chris. Okay, right. <laughs> this is yeah. Kartikeya, the 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 great general of the gods. Um, you know, divine murderer of his foes, rides a peacock into battle, and so these these are war peacocks. You probably couldn't tell at first glance, but yeah. And you know, if you look uh, into their eyes, you'll see that they're trained killers. I, I was actually aver averting my gaze, so that's why I didn't notice so far. I do remember that there's some peacocks in the Picatrix, though. I remember some like John Michael Greer uh, illustrations, so that that could be a tie-in as well. Oh yeah, you know there uh, there's also a, a demonic spirit that uh, in one of the traditional grimoires that takes on the the shape of a peacock-headed man. Mm, good times. All right. Well, speaking of a demonic spirit, shall we talk about the astrology of, of August? Uh, <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, the peacocks of say, war. I was say, are speaking crowing. of demonic spirits, how are you, Nick? Um, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, all right. So, transitions. Do we have anything to review from our last month's forecast? I didn't really prepare anything. I mean, you know, the world is still weird. Uh, COVID is not going great. There's a new variant, BA4 and BA5, that's like taken off in the US and uh, it seems to be breaking through the vaccines. So, even people that had the vaccinations and the boosters are like getting COVID again or sometimes getting it 
a second time not too long after. So that's really sucks. Um, well, so Chris, there is, I can think of one thing that's, um, that we explicitly talked about, um, which is, um, food shortages. Um, like that has, um, that has started to really happen. And as we talked about last month, um, July, you know, it's really the second half of July when it really ramps up and a lot of that same pattern runs through August. And so now we're just very much in that period. One feature of which is the, you know, is food shortages and then all of the follow on effects. And that is happening. That is happening very clearly. Um, and you know, one of the sort of uh, one, one of the more dramatic cases, um, <clears throat> with, uh, the logistics and the supplies and all of that leading to, or triggering or uh, catalyzing, um, political unrest is Sri Lanka. And uh, you can't really Google Sri Lanka or, you know, look at, uh, Sri Lanka on the YouTubes without seeing a dozen different pieces on how, uh, uh asking whether Sri Lanka is Sri Lanka, the first of X number of nations that will experience this kind of pattern. Yeah, I was reading about how um, in the war in Ukraine, the the Russians are like burning some of the wheat fields, and that may exacerbate or lead to a further exacerbation of some of the food issues because of Ukraine being one of the world's primary sources of wheat as a major export of that country. And fertilizer. So it's it's not just that they export wheat, but also Russian Ukraine export a lot of fertilizer. So even for people who aren't needing wheat for, you know. That that lack of fertilizer is hurting almost as much, if not more. Yeah, and that's and so that's next year's harvest, mm, right? Okay. Like it, the what doesn't get planted now is not showing up, is not causing the problem, yeah. right? Uh, I was thinking about that, um, <clears throat> about the 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 problems with fertilizer where there's a shortage or it's just really expensive, and so it's there are certain crops that just weren't um, uh, monetarily efficient to plant this go around that won't be showing up in the market, you know, whenever they, they should have been ready. And I was thinking about the time frame of that and the uh, Uranus, excuse me, the, the Taurus Scorpio eclipses um, with Uranus. So that like Rahu, that head of the dragon with, with Uranus, you know, that runs into next year. And um, I've, I've been wondering privately and somewhat publicly as to whether that's going to time the, you know, the food crisis stuff. Yeah, I mean, we definitely saw the markets over the past couple of months really responded to those eclipses, that last set of eclipses in Taurus and Scorpio. And that was the point where a lot of the um, global, some of the trade markets started to tank and different commodities and, and different things like Bitcoin, for example, tanked at that point. Um, so it really seemed to unlock a lot of the potential that we'd been talking about for a number of years now of that Uranus transit through Taurus um, and some of the associations with food and commodities and especially the square between Saturn and Uranus. It really seemed to unlock that in a major way when those eclipses hit. So that would make sense if six months later, the next time we see the next set of eclipses if we see a further acceleration of that. But this month, I know we're going to talk a lot about the Mars ingress into Taurus and how it's going to be meeting up with Uranus and Saturn and probably speeding that up and exacerbating that as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, because it's all other uh, – Saturn and Mars, that square, which has just been screaming loudly, I don't know about you guys, but uh, – um, just everywhere I turn, it seems to be in effect. But um, when Mars joins Uranus, Saturn sending the square to both those planets at once, it, it almost sort of like doubles the the fun. You've got two two planets that want to go, um, being sort of restrained by Saturn um, all at once. So it's uh, yeah, it, it amps it up. And that's really what begins the month, right? Uh, here on July 23rd, as we're recording, we're like edging, we're edging closer to those perfect aspects. And that's really the note that July ends on is <clears throat> Mars, Uranus, and the North Node uh, square Saturn. And those dynamics, um, uh, those dynamics are further amplified um, and sort of kept alive um, for really the first half of August, because we have 
um, <clears throat> in addition to this square between um, uh, Rahu, Uranus, Mars, and Taurus, um, which is you know all this disruptive energy around supplies and dinner um, and all that squared Saturn um, for the you know for the first two weeks of August, especially yeah first two weeks of August we have the Sun moving into we have Mercury and then the Sun moving into a T square with them, so further activating it. Um, uh, opposing Saturn and squaring Mars, Uranus, Rahu, and our full moon in Aquarius, which happens, you know, uh, every time the sun's in Leo once a year, um, is right on Saturn and is further activating it. You know, the sun and moon are really milking everything we can get out of this, this big fun square. Yeah, look at that. So a lot of that's relevant. I mean, Last year, we talked a lot about how it was weird how every time Mars moved into one of the fixed signs where it made a hard aspect with Saturn again, that we got you know new mutations of COVID and different variants kept emerging. So that's one of the reasons why I was mentioning that at the top of this. And But it's also interesting now that Mars is back in a fixed sign that um, just today, the World Health Organization, I saw in the Washington Post, um, officially declared a, a global health emergency for uh, monkeypox. That this is actually like spreading really rapidly in a bunch of countries. Um, the largest country is up to like three thousand cases, I think, in Spain. But the U.S. has already become the second largest country with just under three thousand cases. So somehow it's like getting at, like really out of control as another weird sort of virus that's going around. Um, at again another turning point with Mars and fixed signs squaring Saturn. Yeah, remember, um, Chris, do you remember the Mars Saturn conjunction in Scorpio? I don't know, eight years ago. Um, and we it was Mars Saturn Scorpio, and we got that was when Ebola really had its day. Um, you know, the, the those Mars Saturn conjunctions, you know, in the the sort of mundane sky, really seem capable of unleashing. Or Mars Saturn configurations really seem like they've got a, a whole host of um, different maladies, you know, disease disease among them, but not limited to. That that was the interesting thing about being in South Africa when the pandemic hit is because of things like Ebola and what have you, you know, happening in neighboring countries. It wasn't their first rodeo, you know. It wasn't like in the West where this thing was just coming out of the blue and. Not, nobody had ever dealt with anything like it before. Um, you know, Africa's dealt with their their share of uh, of outbreaks, so they they sort of they had more of a mechanism in place to you know it, it yeah it nothing seemed like it was overtly shocking even when the lockdown seemed quite extreme. Yeah, I mean, half of the or, or a goodly portion of the 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 shock of uh, of of the COVID pandemic um, was that I, I think a lot of people, especially in America, didn't have a paradigm <clears throat> for how to deal with an outbreak of plague. Right? Yeah, that, exactly. that had been um, sort of culturally assigned to the bad part of history that was over. Yeah. Well, that was what was so weird about you mentioning the Ebola outbreak, um, Austin, that happened under the Mars-Saturn conjunction in Scorpio. And then again, the COVID lockdowns and stuff originally, at least in the US, happened when Mars met up with Saturn and there was that conjunction in Capricorn with all of those other planets. But I just remember learning traditional astrology and how in all the ancient texts, like they talk about Mars-Saturn conjunctions as being the signature you look for for the outbreak of plagues and like major diseases and things like that. But you know, back then that just seemed so quaint, not quaint, but like yeah, not, no, no, did, no longer did. relevant. Yeah, yeah. It's just I think I think quaint's not not wrong at all. Okay, quaint. So, but because it's like some of those other delineations just are just so wild and extreme in the ancient astrological texts. Like, if the native has this, they will be eaten alive by dogs or something crazy like that. And you're just like, well, this doesn't seem particularly relevant to modern times. So we're going to have to update this a little bit. But but no, it turns out that sometimes Mars Saturn alignments can still co correlate with the outbreak of like major pandemics and plagues. Yeah, it's um, it's almost like we didn't actually escape history. Yeah, it's a, almost, or that much of the system of astrology that was developed two thousand years ago, or 
three three thousand years ago or what have you that the fundamental fundamentals of life are still so similar and so much the same that that's why that system still works two thousand years later because they did a pretty good job of of putting it together and things haven't changed as much as we like to to think they have sometimes in modern times. Absolutely, you know the the more time I spend with uh, those older delineations the less absurd they seem because i see it happen um you know be like oh this person will die of you know like there there's a there's a delineation in there are a lot of death delineations in firmicus uh, where it's like you'll die of hemorrhoids and i was like oh that's that's cartoonish but it's like <laughs> oh people you know it's like rectal polyps and anal you know uh, col- uh, colon cancer etc cetera, etc cetera. it's like oh that's actually just a thing that happens it's not um it's not like something we can dismiss as cartoonish and and quaint as you were saying I, I do feel like that's a great word something 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 preparation h i don't know <laughs> yeah well this is, this episode is getting off to a great start with the, some of our discussion topics uh right at the beginning yeah what in is, august you'll die of hemorrhoids <laughs> yeah bad news or you'll be killed by a peacock <laughs> right, a demonic peacock. Um, so I don't think we have any more reviews. So we're pretty much already getting into the forecast. Should we just dive into the into the rest of it? I think so. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I want to show the chart again for some of those dates. So we're recording this as Austin said today on July twenty third, which is notable because we like to put the date in and and let people know even if we release it like a week later after editing that that's when it was recorded for whatever it's worth. But August 1st, right away at the very top of the month, we get that triple conjunction of Mars, the North Node, and Uranus at about 18 degrees of Taurus. So that opens up the entire month. And then only seven days later, on August 7th, Mars then goes from the conjunction with Uranus right into the square with Saturn from 22 Taurus to 22 Aquarius. So that is our opening of the month basically signature and as a result of that it was actually one of the hardest months for me when i looked ahead at this year to pick good electional charts to find good elections just because it's really hard to to navigate around two really intense uh planetary alignments like that um during the course of just trying to pick an auspicious election or a lucky date um why don't we start with the mars uranus north node conjunction though um, since that really opens up the entire month for us. Yeah. So what are some of your keywords, Nick, for Mars Uranus conjunctions? Um, well, I mean, there's there's a lot of those obvious ones. Uh, you know, accidents are, are come to mind. Uh um ones that are that come about from too much uh speed or carelessness or recklessness. Um, but uh, having, having looked at history, interestingly enough, you think of it as being, um, this very sort of martial, uh, 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 you know, potentially masculine kind of, uh, um, configuration. Uh, but actually in, in the, in the history books, the, the Mars Uranus North Node stuff, uh, tends to, has coincided very often enough with, um, the the sort of political or martial takedown of women, of uh, women in power. Uh, Marie Antoinette was beheaded uh, close to a Mars Uranus North Node conjunction. Um, Madame Mao, you know, when Mao Tse Tung died in 1976, his wife was sort of scapegoated along with this so-called gang of four, um, and all the the evils of the Cultural Revolution were blamed on them exclusively, and. Um, she was sort of yeah put put on trial and and denigrated and all this stuff so that was october of 76 that was another mars uranus north node um so yeah taking that women in power um not that i see that many around me these days um but um you know unless there's a military coup in new zealand next week or something um but but that has been i mean just you know sort of thematically that's one of the things i've noticed um, there, there was another one, but it's not coming to mind right now. Um, but yeah, women, uh, women in power, uh, falling from grace. Okay. Well, that, that's really interesting. Chris, were you going to say something? Uh, no, go ahead. Okay. 
Well, that's, um, you know, it's very, it's very common that people uh, associate Uranus with the revolutionary. Mm -hmm. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of times not appropriate texture given to what revolutionary means, right? It means toppling those who uh, currently have power, right? Or, you know, t uh, taking them down or destroying their reputations or, you know, some, something like that. So there, you know, that's, that's certainly part of it. Um, and what you were saying about accidents is really interesting, Nick, because when I did work on Uranus and Taurus, right, which is going to point more towards, um, you know, substances or yeah, than, than a lot of Uranus positions, I found a lot of, uh, historic accidents, like giant oopsies, um, where there's like, we stored the gunpowder, we stored, you know, 15 tons of gunpowder next to the church and somebody smoked a <laughs> cigarette and it blew right. up the cathedral. Right. And we had one of those, um, God, uh, I want to say it, it all blends together. I want to say last year about this time, um, it was, God, I can't remember where, uh, but it was a Mars Uranus configuration. And there was just a bunch of, uh, explosive. There was a bunch of, yeah, it was in Beirut. Thank you. Uh, comments. Thank you. Gatana. Um, or Gautana. Oh, um, oh, of course, the 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 that terrible explosion. Yeah, the terrible explosion. It was the, literally the, like you were oh, saying, yeah, accidents, yeah. Uh, yeah. recklessness, carelessness, like storing what is storing Taurus, what is volatile, um, you know, Uranus, and then all it needs is the match, right? That which is Mars, and so there's that. And just to come back to something you talked about at the beginning, we were talking about this same configuration, Nick, um, with Saturn trying to restrain Uranus now for a year, over a year and a half. Right. Um, one of the ways I've been looking at it um, with uh, just the North Node joining Uranus and certainly with Mars is Saturn may have been capable of kind of restraining Uranus in a one-on-one -on -one with Saturn in the superior position, um, but now it's three against one. Right, yeah. and so there, it, it, the, there, it's uh, it's not possible to restrain. You don't you don't win a three on one fight, even if you've got the the high ground, unless you're Bruce Lee, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, and somebody wrote the script for you, right, right, um, yeah, no, no, that 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 makes a whole lot of sense. Um, the the that's the thing is that the the three on one kind of fight. It, it does it does uh um sort of send the thing into a whole off balance puts the teeter totter in uh in an upright position um your mention nick of accidents reminded me of um frida kahlo who had a who was born with yeah. a mars uranus conjunction in the 6th house opposite to her her son and her ruler of the ascendant she was leo rising with the sun in cancer in the 12th house um, but she just had that terrible um, accident on like on a, a bus. on a bus yeah. um, that you know left her with some major injuries uh, and stuff that would stick with her and that she would wrestle with for the rest of her life. But it was a, yeah. it was sort of like a freak or a sudden like accident. Yeah, yeah, and the the transits for that accident are pretty crazy because Mars was opposite Uranus, so the accident was September seventeenth, nineteen twenty five. And you had Mars at 22 Virgo in between the uh, new moon, moon at 20 Virgo, sun at 24 Virgo. Uh, and Mars at 22 Virgo was opposite Uranus at 23. So yeah, natally she had the conjunction. The accident happened on an opposition. Um, so it's a pretty, yeah, real sort of literal astrology in her case. Uh, yeah. And it changed everything. I mean, she wouldn't, she wouldn't be Frida Kahlo if she hadn't been in that bus accident, but it was a huge price to pay. Um, but yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing. Um, it, in fact, it, um, I had a client not long ago, uh, with, uh, who's already had two sort of serious accidents in the last couple of months. And this person has a uh, Mars Uranus square. So just the, um, the, the fact that the conjunction's happening now seems to be really triggering this person's square and, um, yeah, the, you know, things like falling asleep at the wheel and stuff like that is, um is what can happen. Um, so definitely anyone who has natal Mars Uranus configured, um, this is a time when your natal aspect can really be um, emphasized and sort of uh, awoken 
Yeah, if you're accident prone, this is not. Don't start off the month with uh, risk taking. Right. Don't like jump like a uh, some cars like over a ravine or something like the that at this time on like around August first. Don't don't try to do a Johnny Knoxville um, impersonation. Yeah, yeah. Um, what are some positive manifestations of Mars Uranus conjunctions? Um, Sometimes I think about like just like quirky actions. Like sometimes Uranus just goes against the grain, but sometimes that can be, you know, kind of um, interesting and like cutting edge or, or pushing the boundaries on things. Um, I think about like, for example, like um, Robin Williams, for example, was Scorpio rising with Mars conjunct Uranus and Cancer and had this really sort of quirky. He had this sort of like really quirky, uh, you know, humor, but it ended up being something that eventually w was sort of like endearing and that he was able to use in his benefit by sort of like leaning into it rather than trying to suppress it or, or avoid it in some way. Well, he was a master improviser, which yeah. I think that really is a sort of Mars Uranus thing. In fact, I'm, I, I used to love, he'd be promoting a movie and I wouldn't necessarily be that interested in the movie, but anytime he was on like anyone's talk show, Letterman or whoever, I would always watch because he would just take the show over and just like create total anarchy and chaos and be so damn funny. Right. Um, well, I like that. That that's that's a really good example because there's you know so if Uranus likes to upset the existing order of things, you know, and and Mars is when you have the that martial capability joining Uranus. Um, it's sort of like the, I don't know, the general of disorder, right? Like it's a very yeah. forceful creation of disorder. Well, because Mars Mars doesn't give a fuck. Like that is the planet of gives no fucks. And Uranus also has a similar energy. So it's like you're putting together two planets that have no, that sometimes like do not care about social conventions and are therefore willing to and able to transgress them or you know, cut through them or or disrupt them um, very easily. Yeah, um, neither are conflict averse, right? Neither are risk averse. Um, That's a good point. Neither are ni neither prioritize social harmony. Mm. Right. Yeah, that's really good. So, so uh, not prioritizing social harmony as sort of one of the large sort of configurations that's setting the tone for August right at the top of the month. And this is something that's been building up because Mars actually went into um, Taurus in early July, on the 5th of July. So this is a conjunction that's kind of been building up since that point, but it really reaches a fever pitch at this point right at the very top of August. And so that reminds me of something that we didn't mention in the what's been going on the last month. So with Mars having been in Taurus for a lot of July and co-present with Uranus, um, farmer farmers protests. Okay. Oh, well, this takes us back to food. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, it, it it's like you know if you're looking for, um, you know if you're looking if you see a Uranus configuration, you're looking for politically, you're looking for who are your protesters, who are your radicals, and you couldn't you know you couldn't do simpler archetypal math and be like I don't know. People who make food, they're protesting, right? The Mars and Tor Mars and Uranus in Taurus, which of course, right, is connected to food, is connected to for fertilizer, is connected to Saturn and Aquarius um, policies around food and agriculture. Um, which, if you look into the Sri Lanka situation, there were some very foolish, uh, foolish and corrupt policies that created the possibility of the situation. And Sri Lanka is in no way unique in having foolish and corrupt policies around food. Yeah, that reminds me because seeing some of the things on social media from Sri Lanka what were, you know, a bunch of just like a, a tons of people, thousands of people uh, storming the presidential palace or the presidential house or compound. And that makes me think of your thing, Nick, mentioning Marie Antoinette. And just the idea of um, protest being a very yeah. Mars Uranus thing, but also sometimes like like a like a violent or aggressive sort of like uprising of people or ups, upswelling of people that that tears down some existing order or some existing social order as being part of the the archetype for that combination. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, you want to talk about uprisings. You know what happened when Mars and Uranus were conjunct the Saturn square? No. The attack on Fort, Fort Sumter, which began the American Civil War. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that is a less positive one. Well, no, but it's an uprising. It's the same kind of thing. Uh, Confederate yeah. forces tried to seize a fort, and, and the Union troops were sent in, and uh, yeah, big battle ensued, and that's basically the beginning of the war. Uh, but it did begin with an uprising, I mean, that was the whole, um, the whole thing about it. You know, it's really funny actually that you mentioned that because I'm just the. I think the last hearing of the January sixth hearings just took place like yesterday, and that's about mm. what was essentially like an uprising that happened in early January, January sixth of twenty twenty one, when Mars first went into Taurus. It was our last. Mars, Uranus, and Taurus. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. So, and that has been really interesting seeing that over the past few weeks. Once Mars returned back to Taurus, you know, what a year and a half later, and seeing them um, bringing out all of this old stuff and every day in the news, it seems like there's been a new little piece of information that's been dropped about what was happening behind the scenes then, and and different things like that. The latest news was Mike Pence's Secret Service detail were calling their wives to say goodbye. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So um uh and so just like just like with that situation um you know this is a it's not just Uranus, right? Um there's also Saturn. And so it <clears throat> there's the you know the 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 act the the rev, the revolting act, the act of revolting, right? Or challenging whatever power structure. Um but then Saturn is there and then Saturn Saturn then attempts to reassert control. And especially, you know, in this case where we've got, what is it, four or five degrees between uh, the square, the conjunction to Uranus and the square to Saturn, right? So this has a, this has a particular sequencing for Mars, right? It's, you know, hitting Uranus and, uh, and Dragon's Head, like, boom, hitting that, like, whatever disruptions and um, disorder or whatever, and then beat, beat, beat. Then you have the square to Saturn, Right. Um, and again, it's Saturn in a uh, superior position to to Mars, right? So there's very much this, you know, Empire Strikes Back or like attempt to reassert control after the disorder, um, <clears throat> you know, which is different than if it was, than if Saturn, if the Saturn thing was first, there would be like, oh, this control is too oppressive and then revolt. But here we have like disorder and then beat, beat, beat whatever attempts to control the situation. Um, mm. And so we've got that with Mars itself, but we also have Mercury doing that same sequence. Mercury and Leo is going to hit Mars, Uranus, North Node, and then hit Saturn. And the Sun is going to hit Mars, Uranus, uh, North Node, and then hit Saturn, right? And then the Moon uh, several times is going to make the same uh, the same aspects where the Moon will trigger Mars, Uranus, you know, uh, the disruption and then attempt at control. So the, this sequence is going to play out over and over and over again. Yeah. And you brought up another really important point, which is that this is all happening in the backdrop of we're, we're in the very steep part of the curve where that Saturn Uranus square is coming back for its final closest pass this fall, um, this fall in the Northern Hemisphere. And here, for those watching the video version, you can see in this graph from Archetypal Explorer. Um, that we're on that upslope that kind of peaks uh, around the beginning of October where Saturn and Uranus get back to, I think, within about a degree of squaring each other for the closest pass that they're going to have before they start eventually moving away. But so, so we're heading into that and it's reactivating that Saturn-Uranus square that we talked about so much when we had those three exact hits of it last year. And one of the keywords that came up recently, like a month ago, that I thought was really pertinent and relevant was the sudden loss and destabilization or disappearance, like the crumbling of a structure that you've taken for granted in your life for a long time up to that point that may not have been built on as stable of foundations as you assumed up until the point at which it disappeared. And I mean, the, the most obvious example of that from last month, of course, was the Roe versus Wade decision where overnight it just like erased you know something that people have been taking for granted as a 
basic right for over 40 years in the country and then overnight it was kind of gone or yeah or wasn't certain anymore uh no i mean it's it's gone in a number of states at this point so yeah no that's fair that's fair and we'll hopefully the future is not fixed but um yeah i hear you yeah well i mean in the meantime there's like 10 year old girls that are getting pregnant and can't you know receive an abortion or their doctors getting hate mail for doing that or other people like women who uh, there was a story of a woman from texas that had to carry like a, a fetus that had died for like two weeks because she couldn't get an abortion there so there's some really bad stuff happening regardless of if it's rolled back at some point in the future so saturn you're in a square any well, other okay, thoughts so on let's that? let's um <clears throat> so um how should we say they so the <clears throat> that um sort of sudden demolition of something that was taken for granted can right. be really negative as in that case it's not always that negative especially in individual nativities yeah right? that's a good point sometimes um you know sometimes the you know the uh, as should we say a, a wall a saturnian wall crumbling um instead of leaving you unprotected um leaves you without um a limitation that you just thought you had to work within your whole life Right. Like sometimes you're just like, oh, I just thought that that's the way it was. And I always had to stay inside this boundary. And I never, I didn't even think, you know, anyone was allowed out. And then sometimes, sometimes something will come down. Sometimes it's mental, sometimes it's emotional, sometimes it's literally life getting, you know, like uh, a very physical uh, thing. But we're just like, oh, you mean I get to do that? I didn't think that was possible. Yeah. I love that because that's like, it's that energy where sometimes the person takes it into their own hands to basically take a wrecking ball to a wrecking ball to those structures in their life that are no longer serving them and this is finally the point at which they're ready to do that and it's not easy and it can be a painful process to because it's always especially for fixed signs and this is taking place in fixed signs so it's tending to affect those with fixed sign placements the most um, and change can be really difficult for fixed signs but sometimes necessary uh, to demolish old structures in order to make way for new growth and get rid of things that are no longer serving you. And I would just add, sometimes, sometimes um, when I see like a change like that, sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes you really have to, you know, uh, knock down the wall. And sometimes um, it just falls over, and you realize that it's been crumbling for years. You're like, oh, this process has been happening the whole time, and I. It, you know, it, it's that, that moment where the structure loses integrity and, you know, uh, a strong gust of wind knocks it over. You're like, oh, this has been building in me forever, right? Or this is, you know, this has been, this has been ongoing. Yeah. And that, you know, for some people, I was talking to somebody, people, somebody like that recently that was making some of those changes, but they said, you know, if I'm honest with myself, I already knew late last year in November around the time of that first eclipse in Taurus that you know this change needed to take place and that it was it was coming and I just wasn't ready for it yet um so I've been paying attention to that as well because that whole eclipse sequence started last November in Taurus it actually makes me a little nervous um Biden recently in the news it was announced that he got covid like a few days ago and I remember he went in for that operation under that first eclipse in Taurus back in November. And then um, right now, Mars just passed over the eclipse degree of the next Taurus eclipse, which was at the end of April. Uh, right, I think it was like the same day that that announcement came out. So it was kind of a weird thing because that's his sixth house, of course, since he has Sagittarius rising. Yeah. Hasn't looked great for him for a while. Yeah, well, it's just some of the we had mentioned in previous forecast episodes that we were nervous about the activation of his sixth and twelfth house, sixth and twelfth houses with some of these transits. And it's interesting seeing some major new health thing potentially. Hopefully, it's not major, but some new health thing come up around that time when one of those eclipse degrees was activated in his sixth house. So hopefully, it's not it doesn't turn into a bigger deal than you know it could be. Yeah, that that would not be a good thing uh, for him or for a lot of people. <laughs> um, yeah, that um, that's the thing about uh, um, 
the the Saturn square, I think, is is that um, this time around, in in other in other cases, you know, the Mars the the Austin's three on one analogy really, you know, I mean, it 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 holds largely. But I think the the thing about this one is with Saturn being in Aquarius and being in the dominant position in the square, um, he actually Saturn's in a better position than usual to to um, you know do something in the square uh, to have a hand in how things play out in in maybe <clears throat> um, you know shutting down whatever sort of uh, uh, uprising comes up. Um, and and trying especially to, trying to reassert control, reassert control, and like and like Austin's saying, because it's the last one in the sequence, it's sort of it's where everything winds up. Everything you know lands on Saturn after, um, after the Mars Uranus is, has sort of peaked. Although I have seen also in a lot of the Mars Uranus conjunctions I've been studying that it's uh, the the real sort of violence and and uprisings largely seem to happen after Mars has passed Uranus and not when it's preceding Uranus or reaching Uranus. So like after the conjunction has culminated. Uh, mm. But nonetheless, that, I think that, that still speaks to, you know, that first week of August being really, really heavy and then sort of Saturn coming in to, to do something about it. Yeah, so um, what are, when we talk about Saturn-Uranus squares in history, Nick, are there any that come to mind either in mundane or in terms of like natal chart signatures um, for you? I'm looking through my files now and like Lyndon B. Johnson had a Saturn Uranus square, Nelson Rockefeller, Sandra Day O'Connor. May I prompt Nick? So I could think sure. of one. I bet he can take it. So we had the same situation with Saturn, the superior square to uh, Uranus uh, in the late 70s. Uh, that was 76, the, I think. Yeah. That was our last. That was our last one of exactly this. This this of the yeah. two squares where Saturn gets to rise earlier. Um, what was happening in 1976 for those not 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 born then? W were you gonna Were you gonna give me an example there, or were you? Just oh, I don't know. I thought I, I thought you just knew oh. all the stuff. Oh, I, oh I was just okay. trying well, to. You know, oh, oh, I see. Going. Okay, no, no, you you were just giving me the date. Yeah, no, I, well, that that period in 1976 is the period I was referring to earlier with the death of Mao Zedong, um, and and you know, I mean, talk about you know craziness. I mean, um, his death is what ultimately led it led the country a couple of years later to sort of embrace the West and Deng Xiaoping opening up China and all that stuff that happened in the 80s. Um, not that it's amounted to much by now, but um, at the time it it was quite impressive and you know all, stimulated all this growth. But um, the the pretty big shift. But leading up to that, when Mao died, uh, there were these trials for for sort of the people who uh, were esen essentially scapegoats for the Cultural Revolution. Uh, Mao's wife um, and three of her cohorts were put on trial. And that was, that. this was real sort of Saturn. Year. And when, when Saturn speaks in China, like, you know, the world hears it. Um, so yeah, uh, that was, that was that kind of energy of, of putting down an uprising after the fact and sort of Saturn having the last word. Well, and in the United States, there was, um, as I understand it, um, because I was alive, um, for about nine months of the seventies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but as I understand it, that Saturn Uranus period in the U S there was a lot of, there was a feeling of things not being under control. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, 76 is the year that, that Carter's elected, you know, he's elected under a Saturn Uranus square. Um, and that, you know, that was sort of the, uh, you know, he was meant to come in and, and, uh, bring this this clean, fresh new wave of of um, you know into American politics that wasn't corrupted. This is post Watergate and all that stuff. Um, so it was it, it you know there there was that there was that energy at the time. Um, someone saying 1976 was Summer of Sam, but no, that was 1977. I should I gotta nip that in the bud. Um, but yeah, um, 76. 
did have that kind of um that hard Saturn Uranus edge to it. And it, and that's what it you know, like you're talking about the six months of the seventies that you remember. The malaise that followed and all that stuff. I mean that that sort of springs out of the um the Carter administration. Yeah, there when we had um it was by sign, Saturn and Uranus were square like 76, 77, 78. Um, yeah. So, yeah, the exact hits in 76. And then, yeah, and just, you know, if you look at the, uh, do a vibe check on America, you know, there's a sense of like things that should be under control are not in control. Right, right. Um, but it, just going back to the, the, the history of Saturn Uranus squares, I mean, some of the biggest things in history have been Saturn Uranus squares. Um, the fall of Constantinople to the Ottomans in uh, 1453. Uh, the defeat of Mary, Queen of Scots uh, in 1568. And um, the Pueblo Revolt in 1680 um, down in Mexico, which released thousands of horses, Spanish horses, that then ran north into the hands of people we would come to know as the Comanche and uh, you know the, um, all the other uh, Plains tribes who wound up being uh, really gifted horsemen that came out of all these horses that escaped Pueblo in 1680. So to, you know that that really changed the landscape. Um, yeah, just uh, I mean a lot of stuff like that. Um, a lot of like big sort of uh, uh, political changes that 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 you know change entire regimes um the execution of of uh of uh, robespierre in the french revolution um, oh wow yeah well and that that know. plays in really beautiful that rhymes really beautifully with the um M Marie holding Antoinette. people culpable out for the cult cultural revolution in yes china yeah. in the 70s right yeah in fact you could say robespierre is the madame mao of the french revolution or madame mao is the Robespierre of the Chinese Revolution, something to that effect. Although she didn't get her head chopped off, she was sent. She was sort of sent to jail, which in some ways is worse in China. But anyway, um, I just pulled up the chart for the fall of Constantinople, which is interesting. But you mentioning that is really interesting because I was just thinking historically, the fall of Constantinople was the end, the final end of the Roman Empire, basically. Yes, um, be because you know people think about. The Roman Empire ending centuries earlier when um, Rome and Italy fell, but the capital of the Roman Empire had already been moved to Constantinople, um, you know, by that time, and so they really had inherited and continued essentially the Roman Empire and the the cultural and linguistic and scientific and other um, things that came from that entire civilization continued essentially in Constantinople for centuries until May 29th, 1453. And guess where Mars was on that day? Where um, was Mars on that day, Chris? Mars was at 24 Cancer, and it was conjoining Uranus at 28 Cancer, and they were both squaring Saturn at 24 right. Libra. Oh, you also have a nice, uh, uh, perfect Sun-South uh, Node conjunction. Mm. You know, you're talking about like the death of uh, you know, an empire and emperors. Yeah, it's right in be right in between the um, the lunar and solar eclipses. Yeah, that means it was preceded by a, an eclipse in Sag. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this this came out, and they're definitely you know this came out of a fairly long battle, so that that lunar eclipse definitely would have been part of the peak of that battle. A really good series on Netflix about that, by the way. Um, Interesting. So one one thing, let me. I want to kind of lead this into back into the present and sort Wait, of no, the next bit. So we'll move on to the present yet. I want to dwell on that because it's really important historical point that the end of the Roman Empire that we essentially have a date for it and it ended under the exact configuration that we're talking about historically. Um, if there's any way we can expand on that historically or like anything else to say about that, because um, that seems really notable in terms of remember how we were talking earlier about things that you've taken for granted that just seem obvious and have been around forever as long as you can remember and that you just take for granted as something that will always be there but then all of a sudden something comes in and completely destabilizes that structure which is uranus and then mars swoops in and actually demolishes it if the foundations are ultimately unstable 
Um, that's such a we were just talking about that archety archetypally, and I know we were drawing on instances like last year, for example, that apartment building that collapsed in Florida mm -hmm. the day of one of the exact Saturnianus squares, or we were talking more broadly, metaphorically about um, Roe versus Wade being struck down more recently as an example of that. But this is literally like a like a historical example of that exact archetype that we're talking about in action here at the very end, in some ways, the very last day, essentially, of the end of the Roman Empire. And make no mistake, if Putin succeeds in, in Ukraine, he's coming after this country and that country and this country and that country, and he won't stop until he retakes Constantinople. Well, it's a long-standing um, long you know, Russian dream. I would say that... Um, you know the uh, the the Saturn Uranus squares do not um, form a very good historical backdrop for empire building. They you know we, we have a lot of we have a lot of um, literally the opposite cases, right? Uh, the Confederates with Fort Sumter. Um, okay, yeah. The how did that did, work out? Yeah, the Ottomans did get an empire for a little while, but it barely lasted. I mean, they they took Constantinople, but they started to degrade within a hundred years from then or whatever. I mean, they had maybe 200 good years before they started to fall apart. Gradually, the sick man of Europe. So do you want to go ahead, Austin, and take that into the present? Because I Yeah. Mean so, um, you know, we're talking about these Saturn Uranus squares as, uh, as periods. And, you know, we, uh, I don't, we didn't all do this in the late seventies. Um, the, uh, that some of one uh, one third of us here did this in the in the late seventies, <laughs> um, but you know we have uh, you know we have examples within recent history um, and not so recent history, and so we're actually like this next four months. This is kind of the almost the last of this um, because we have these really intense activations, right? We have Mars activating it now, and then you know as soon as we're done with Mars, we're ramping up to. Um, Saturn and Uranus being square within the same degree, and they hold that for almost a month. And then we get a pair of eclipses on them at the very end of October and November. Um, and then Mars, the the positive side of Mars retrograde in Gemini is that Mars is not in a square to Mars or Uranus. It's not configured. Saturn and then by early March, we're done with Saturn and Aquarius. No more, no more Saturn Uranus squares. And so a lot of the like like the the payout of this Saturn square Uranus period um, that we've been in, that we we did like a preview quarter during the second quarter of 2020, and then we did it for all of 2021 and all of 2022. Like we're almost done with this and next and on to the next thing. Like we're right now, this is the season finale, right? Like the next, you know, from now till the end of the year. Um Right, but does it? But does the season finale end on a cliffhanger? Um, I think the next. I, I think the Saturn Neptune season. Um, it wouldn't make sense to start that one without watching how how this crazy season ended. But very different vibes. Right. Well, that, right. that's what's making me nervous though about the Constantinople, um, like like comparison or discovery of that being the same configuration. Is because Nick, you and I were already talking about this on. I think our astrology chat episode two episodes ago towards the end of that we're having trouble not ending it on kind of like a downer because we're talking about the uranus return of the united states coming out <laughs> right. here in just a few years and how that's historically coincided first with the civil war and then second with world war ii and um yeah uh, you know we're also experiencing the pluto return at this time and questions of the sort of like threats to the democracy and like the survival of of having a democratic um process and everything else and the attempts to sub subvert that um that makes me nervous seeing that that sort of combination with constantinople and then going into november where we're going to have that next taurus eclipse which we noticed noted in the year ahead forecast is going to fall exactly on the midterm election day um, on november 8th 2022. So it's like that next eclipse is very closely tied into the very next election that's coming up in the United States. You know, I mean, disorder will be is guaranteed, right? The things are not going to be more orderly and coherent after this. Like Saturn Uranus 
never leaves that behind, especially not boosted by the nodes. Um, you know, like that's inevitably a result. But then we've got the next chapter in history. Yeah, it just makes me nervous about an acceleration of that process that you mentioned of dis disorder. And if the disorder isn't ramping up as we head into some of those bigger transits, because we've got the, of course, the Mars retrograde um, in Gemini in the entire second half of this year, which is actually going to be crossing over the natal Mars Uranus conjunction that the United States already has built into its birth chart for the July 4th, 1776 Declaration of Independence chart um, and activating that conjunction that's already in there, but then also as we move into some of the longer term transits of Uranus going into Gemini here in just a few years in what, 2025? Yeah, I, I believe that's the first ingress. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of with and not with both of you on on some of these points. I'll I'll, I'll just um like to to Chris's point, um a lot of the Mars Uranus conjunctions getting a square from Saturn, things like Constantinople, the Pueblo Revolt, Fort Sumter, these are very sort of definitive actions. Like they they decide something and change things for good in a very very big way. Um, and and so even if even though the transit does sort of move off and we go into a new age, um, wherever we're headed, we're headed with the consequences of whatever comes out of the the you know triple configuration. Um, so it's it's a it's a new world. It's not whatever we're talking when we're talking about the transit wearing off. We're not thinking about and you know things go back to July twenty third, twenty twenty two again. Um, it's, it's sort of a whole new playing field. Um, and, and, um, yeah, at the same time, I don't think like Chris is maybe getting a bit ahead of himself at the same time thinking like, you know, could this be the, the fall of, you know, American democracy? Um, I think August is a little soon for that to happen. Not that that's not sort of in the cards, yeah. but but I'm talking about the precursors to that, which is yeah, yeah, yeah. If okay. hypothetically then, 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 that then happens, not, then then we're more in agreement. Okay, I mean, um, I'm thinking hypothetically, like of a scenario of like the next presidential election is going to be really crucial in 2024, and who gets elected then. The precursor to that is, for example, they're doing those. Uh, investigations or whatever into the attempt to thwart the democratic process that happened on January 6, 2021, but I don't doesn't seem like that's going anywhere is really going to end up convicting anybody. But then if and then if it doesn't and then if the house changes hands in November, so that removes that as another check or thing that's sort of part of the balance of power that keeps things in check and allows things not to get completely out of whack. And then that sets things up for 2024, where we have the next presidential election and whoever gets elected or reelected. And then we immediately after that go into the Uranus return and the next great American eclipse, which I think then is that year as well, right? Right. Wait, so wait, when is it? Uh, 2024, I believe. And it crosses over America, just like the one in 2017, just after Trump had been elected. Yeah, I don't know. I, um, I, I personally don't see any help from whoever's in office in 2024. I've been looking at 2028 as a while, uh, for a while. Like we'll be out of the Saturn Neptune years. The Saturn Neptune years, I think, are literally just going to be a mess. Um, I think it's going to take until 2028 to get somebody who can do something that is useful. That's an opinion at this point, but I, I, I guess I have zero, um, hope or excitement or positive feelings about 2024 you know the thing about um the previous times that uranus has made its ingress to gemini okay not that i mean the revolutionary war is is a different kettle of fish but the civil war in the second world war you had a president in place who's ready for everything that's about to go down even though everyone around him is not quite ready for things to go down the way they are um, and in Lincoln's case, absolutely no one has any confidence in him whatsoever. He's a totally unknown entity, and even people in his own cabinet don't give him much, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, encouragement. 
in the in the early days. Although they all come to win, as uh, they all come to respect them a lot um, as time goes on. Um, if things really are repeating in such a cyclical fashion, whoever does sort of step up in twenty four is likely to be the sort of the the you know um the likely to be someone who's already sort of in place to some degree no i i so that's a great point historically and you know a big part that's of what uh, austin said last month that's yeah, what you for, said last month right well so what i what i said is that um so i i i didn't say that they would be there ahead of time nick's obviously correct historically um, what we do definitely get every time is we get um, literally the most sainted leaders of the United States. Right. We have George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and um, Roosevelt. Yeah. Right. And there are also people who wield, um, who are able to really, how should we say, direct the government uh, in a way that most presidents aren't. I don't know. No. No. Yeah. Lincoln and FDR had a had a each in their own way a very special facility. For working in government that no other you know president has had yeah and and with um uh roosevelt you also have someone who's in office for longer than anyone yeah and so you do um historically get these really like um uh barely precedented leaders um you know of great historical import um i i will just say i i can't see and that doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but I can't see that happening in 2024. I think the Saturn-Neptune, um, uh, I think the Saturn-Neptune in Pisces is too much of a prohibition because that it's like squaring what Uranus right. is going to do. I, I feel like the Saturn-Neptune years are just too messy. I think it's going to wait till 2028 this time, but that's that's uh, okay. probably pretty distant from this August. It's not that distant anymore. Um, you know, I when when I was doing Uranus USA, I remember thinking, well, you know, someday Uranus is going to go into Gemini and I'll have to talk about this, but that's so far away. Um, yeah, that was like episode 10 of the Astrology Podcast. <laughs> exactly. Can we just plug Nick's book for a second? We like Nick can. wrote a book about the history of the United States yeah. and Uranus and Gemini like 10 years ago. But you have to you have to stand by for the second edition. Is it not available? It's not available these days, no. Oh, um, I'm sorry. But thank you're you. A, you're thank pulling you. you're pulling a 36 decans is what he <laughs> Yeah. So join the club. <laughs> yeah. By the way, That's should we hot. plug Austin's book? 30 <laughs> 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 All right. Touche. Yeah, yeah. But thank Touché. you, Austin. Um so to wrap up this section, one of the because I, I realized it's really funny that we've had this role reversal, Austin, where I'm becoming the pessimistic one about this and you're the one that's trained having to constantly bring in some optimism. It's just because I felt like after 2016 and after 2020, that one of my shortcomings as an astrologer was like a failure of imagination of just like thinking practically speaking, aside from the astrology, it's like, there's no way that's going to happen. There's no way the worst case scenario happens because that would be disastrous and therefore holding back or pulling back. So one of the things is I'm seeing some of the more challenging and tricky mundane transits, especially as they re relate to the US, is trying to think through all scenarios of like, you know, what if the worst case scenario did happen? What would it look like and what would be the sequence of events? And that's one of the things that has me nervous because I can see one scenario of a direction that that could go, you know, in the worst case scenario. Yeah, that's fair. And I I don't expect a, a rosy future. You know, we have had I, I have become the the um the smiling counterpoint um you know i think we're heading into an era of simultaneous crises on multiple continents for years uh, i think the united states is actually better poised than a lot of other countries to deal with it we we have surplus food and energy which very few places have so at least be able to kind of eat um while sorting out our our uh, our situation globally and internally I'm realizing that the peacocks now are actually an extension of your positive aura and the shift that's taken place. Seriously, I'm going to get some new wallpaper. It really seems to do the trick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah look, um, that that we have been liberated in a way as astrologers. We we uh, don't just need to find the positive spin, although obviously everyone's hoping right. for the best. Um, I, 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 on reflection, when I'm looking at these events. Not so much like the 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 P 
people going on trial like Marie Antoinette or, or Robespierre or whatever, that aside, but when it comes to these big uprisings, the, you know, the Constantinople's and the Fort Sumter's and the, uh, you know, everything else we've been talking about, it does seem like in these instances, the, the underdogs do seem to triumph. Um, come to think of it much as I want to give sort of Saturn the, the, the credo it gets. I mean, Definitely, the the Ottomans are the underdogs at Constantinople. You know, the 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 emperor of uh, you know Constantine, up until the last minute, thinks that he's going to win. Um, it's really sort of surprising. Um, Fort Sumter. I mean, you know, basically, I mean that that's what started the war. But it is, it is the the Confederates sort of you know standing up to. The Union in that case, and the Union doesn't exactly, you know, win. I mean, that's why the the war continues. So there so is the, the the underdogs in that instance are the Confederates. And well, the, yeah, 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 right. And I mean, look how that all. worked out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, in, the, in the big picture, it didn't work out for them, but on that day, in that like for that that instance, um, it did. Yeah, I, no, that's the war, not filling the, me with great. Oh. Yeah, I don't think we can take the result of an individual battle. I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't think like you can't say the yeah the could like the under the Confederates really um they they really won that civil war. You know, the South was really in a lot better position afterwards. Like the no, result no, no, of no, that that's conflict not what I'm saying. was that's not what pretty I'm saying. no, but at 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 devastating. at Sum at Sumter itself. Anyway, um, yeah, it's 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 the underdogs sort of persevering for the time being. Okay. Well, no, I'm not trying to say that they won the civil war. Um, <laughs> sometimes that's, sometimes that's like a, a Rocky type, you know, scenario. Yes. No, no, it is. It is. I, I'm, I'm just musing. I'm thinking out loud. Like in other, a lot of these other, other times the underdog is like trying to keep like slavery and stuff. That's not necessarily like a Rocky. Scenario. No, I get that. I get that. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying the good, I'm not saying being underdogs makes them good guys. I'm just saying that, that they're the underdogs. Anyway, And I think that's an important point. I think that in, the culture of the United States, there is a tendency to always to cast Uranus as the hero. Mm. Um, and you know, it's oh, it's Prometheus, right? It's like no, like the, the there there's no inherent positive or negative moral quality to Uranus revolting, right? Like you have just as many revolutionary villains as you do revolutionary heroes, and most acts of revolution are mixed, you know, mixed complicated human affairs. Um, but you know, you, the United, this United States was born of a successful revolution. So it's like part of our, you know, mythic body. And so it's, it's one of my pet peeves when I read Uranus interpretations is constantly valorizing anything Uranus does. Um, and that's not borne out historically. No, that's for sure. That's, for that's sure. a good point. Cause we saw that as soon as we had that first ingress of Saturn into Aquarius in 2020 is we started seeing on the one hand, like uh some of the George Floyd protests and like the Black Lives Matter protests and different things like that um broke out not too long after that ingress. We also started seeing some of the COVID protests of people that were like against restrictions, which was a really funny like archetypal manifestation of that of people trying to literally like reject restrictions in the middle of of a pandemic. And then later we saw the January 6th thing at the same time. So it's like we've seen a bunch of different manifestations of that all along the political and social spectrums. So that's a really good point that really it's just an underlying energy that's going to find its way to manifest and kind of like express itself in society one way or another. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't mean the heroes are going to win. No, no, no. Hmm. That That's the other thing about this whole Uranus and Gemini return thing is, you know, the U.S. has built up this mythology, like, okay, they win the Revolutionary War, they start a republic, yay. Civil War comes, they defeat slavery, yay. Um, Second World War, they defeat the Nazis and the horrible Japanese, yay. There's this, it's, it's created this myth where, like, you know, the U.S. is always going to triumph over... Uh, um, you know, some some evil regime that pops up and and wants to do horrible things, and and you know the U.S. is always going to triumph. And like, is that really going to always happen with every passage of Uranus through Gemini, or or is this thing going to flip at some point? Right. Well, and nothing continues forever, right? So, what is you know what is a Uranus in Gemini that 
that doesn't, you know, the good thing is it's going to intersect with that narrative, right? But it's not necessarily going to to replicate it. No, right? no. I, I would say coming into it now, right? We're we're in the you know Uranus in the sign before that return to Gemini, right? Yeah. Um, I I, I think the uh, the general belief um, all across you know different demographies and political affiliations is pretty low. Um, the belief is pretty low that like that's going to happen again, or or that um, the United States is even capable uh, of mobilizing in a effective and righteous way. Um, mm-hmm. And it would be interesting to look at, you know, it's like how were people feeling before World War II? How are people feeling, et cetera, et cetera? Not that I'm again, I'm not, I'm not arguing that it's going to repeat, but there's like no country that has shown more reluctance to go to war, I think, than the U.S. pre Second World War. Right. You know? First World War II, for that matter. Um, very ironic for for having this sort of bloodthirsty reputation. They're very, very reluctant to go to war. I mean, that bloodthirsty reputation is really a result of like the post-World War II America, which was really a remaking of America from an institutional level on out. Which is what always happens after Uranus leaves Gemini. Right. And so we can definitely see that like that version are like post-World War II America, like everybody's kind of done with that and it's not working very well and we need to we need to do it we you know we need to remake things again but there's so much uncertainty as to like well is it going to get remade for the worse like which which american dreams and nightmares uh will be given shape <laughs> you know um like the the end of the cycle i think is really clear but what the next beginning is is i can't see it you know uh, I can look at the time frames and say intelligible things, but like I, when I look out, um, I I can't see it. But like again, the sense that like we're we're done with a thing, I think is very clear. One of the things, though, just to remember is like um, Uranus went into Gemini what in like 1942, right, Nick? 42, 41. For um, well, first time in in the summer of 41, then it regressed to um. Taurus, and then it entered in forty two again. So it's like that really marked the entry of the U.S. into World War II. Yes. But there was already like a long buildup prior to that when Uranus was transiting through Taurus. Um, in the build up to that, in the same way that there was a build up to the Civil War before things really, you know, got serious and went down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, and it depends on what you mean by build up. I mean, that's certainly. True there's a, in, in there's precursors cases. that are put in place. Prior, it didn't just like one day we happen to find ourselves in World War II. It was like there was years of, um, you know, Germany starting to like annex different lands and like yeah. doing different aggressive moves and stuff in Europe, building up, rebuilding armaments. Japan had taken huge chunks of China for like five years at that point. Yeah, yeah. No, no. It, it had been going on. Yeah. There's there's a case you can make for it beginning. With uh, Japan annexing Manchuria um, in 31, you can make the case that it began with uh, Italy annexing Ethiopia in 35, or the Spanish Civil War in 36 is often seen as like a, a real precursor to the Second World War. Yeah. So my my point is just that with Uranus in the middle of, of Taurus right now, if we're if we're looking at like a Uranus and Gemini scenario like you know, Civil War and World War II for the United States, when Uranus went into Gemini, then some of yeah. the precursors for that are being put into place right now and, and are al- already theoretically should be emerging and should start to be evident. We just can't fully see them, practically speaking, because we don't know the end result of a lot of those precursors quite yet. Um, but a lot of those precursors should be starting to be put in place now at this point as Uranus is moving through or starts moving through the second half of Taurus in preparation for that. So just paying attention to some of those themes, that will be our, our challenge as mundane astrologers, um, not to have a failure of imagination, to not see whatever the threads are now and where they could carry forward once we get to Uranus and Gemini. Yeah, um, certainly that's true. Um, when those wars erupt, they really take everyone by surprise. Like no one's, right. you know, really expecting them to happen. With the Second World War, I mean, it, in earlier in forty one, um, 
Roosevelt worked out the Lend-Lease thing and he starts sending ships and stuff to, to Britain and then later to the Soviet Union when they're invaded. Um, the first Uranus ingress into Gemini is in August of 1941, and that's when Roosevelt and Churchill meet up for what's called the Atlantic Charter, which is kind of a misnomer because there's no charter. It's just a verbal agreement. But um, it really signifies U.S. support for the Allies against Nazi Germany. And even though it's still four months before Pearl Harbor and all that, from that point, it's kind of a point of no return. Like the U.S. have sort of shown their hand, like who they're, who they're connected to and who they're not. Well, and, and I will also add that at the same time, um, Japan, uh, Imperial Japan was heavily reliant on uh, the United States for iron and gasoline imports. Um, the United States had begun just choking the supply to Japan, which is what led up to, which is the precursor to Pearl Harbor. So there were very strong econ there were very strong economic positions taken. Those were not like um, uh, neutral trading partner relations. Do we have any examples of the U.S. using economic force and choking off other countries that are committing aggressive acts recently as a as a parallel? Yeah, I mean, but that's something like literally every country does all the time. Um, it's, you know, the United States is, we do that in every conflict. We've been doing that to Iran for decades, like Cuba. You know, um, we do have that. I'm just saying it's, it's a very common thing. It's just part of the big game. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just saying interesting parallel and we'll see if that one ends up having a similar parallel since you mentioned Japan and some of that and just yeah, that some yeah. of the economic things ended up leading into what ended up happening with World War II. Which reminds us of now as well. Right. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, people have been mentioning, for instance, like the Arab Spring erupted because of a similar grain shortage, actually a much smaller grain shortage than the one that's going to be falling on the Middle East now. Um, and that was the whole Arab Spring. So we can just imagine... There's that kind of energy. So there's there's the, you know trade and sanctions with Russia, and then there's there's the the sort of uh, the you know the way the way other uprisings can happen uh, due to hunger and and yeah, uh, which brings it back famine. to what what Austin has been saying for months now, which is just that the the food uh, disruptions are going to be a major thing because then that will probably also then subsequently impact. Um, you know, migrations of people. If if you're having a famine in your country, um, you know, moving to a different country in order to fight, try to find sustenance and and food and support, which is kind of what happened with the after the Arab Spring and some of the different migrations and movements of people. Yeah, yeah, and so well, and just to bring it back to Saturn Uranus squares, right? Like this is the you know this is in many ways like the rest of this year is the it's the season finale, right? And then it'll be like, oh, Saturn, Saturn, Neptune, and Pisces. Like, what are we going to do with this mess, right? Because it's going to create a mess, right? And the, the the Neptune one, Saturn, when Saturn moves into Pisces, it's out of dignity, right? So it's the like the control mechanism, Saturn, like being in a much more confused and weaker place for the first time in a long time, and then with Neptune. Right, which does not help clarify things. Um, I, I think it's like mess, and then nobody knows what to do for the Saturn Neptune years. Yeah, to um, hyper abbreviate it. <laughs> right. Um, all right. So since we're an hour and twenty minutes into this episode, I think this would be a good time to take a break and to mention our sponsor is something a little bit more positive and lighthearted, which is that. There, one of the good things about August, especially later in August, once you get away from the Mars Saturn stuff, is there is this really amazing astrological conference that's taking place um, in Westminster, Colorado, August 25th through the 29th, 2022. And this is the International Society for Astrological Research is hosting a major several day international conference with astrologers and speakers flying in from around the world in order to attend basically a week of lectures, workshops, and a ton of other fun stuff that's going to take place over the course of that week. Um, I don't know, do you guys know anybody who's speaking there, or giving any brilliant lectures possibly? I don't know about brilliant. Uh, I'm, I'm speaking. 
Oh, okay. Nick, are you speaking? No, I'm not. I'm mm, not. Pity. Um, yeah, that's a pity. I've been to, I've spoken at a few ESAR conferences and they're wonderful. Um, that was would, the last time I saw you prior to this month, wasn't it? It was at the 2016. Right, that was the last time ISAR I saw conference. Austin. Last time I saw Austin was at ESAR. Well, and really, that's what I was thinking about meeting up with you again. And it felt so good, Nick. And we recorded all those episodes together this month. But before COVID, it's like that was how astrologers met up in person and like hung out with each other is we'd meet up at conferences every once or every year or two, basically, or sometimes once or twice a year. And so you get this nice little like rhythm, but that really got disrupted with um, COVID. This is one of the conferences I think that was originally supposed to take place back in 2020, but got postponed two years now due to the pandemic. So this is going to be the first time a lot of people meet up in person again to hang out. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's a great conference as far as like conferences in the states go. I mean, you know, there's there's the big, big bad UAC, which only comes up once in a blue moon. Uh, but really, for regular, you know, top high quality uh, um, mass astrology conferences in the states, I mean, ESAR really is is the it's the big daddy for those big ones. Yeah, yeah, I've I've not been to an ungreat ESAR conference. And I will also add that the conference is at the end of the month when all when a lot of the tense configurations have um, literally broken apart for a while. The sun is no longer um, T-squaring all that business. Mars has moved out of configuration. Um, it's not, you know, the, the <laughs> I, I have my quibbles with the election of astrology conferences, uh, but this one is safely... Uh, away from the, um, uh, you know, whatever the danger zone. But yeah, I'm going to, I'm giving two lectures. I'll be um, talking about some of the complex and oddly specific um, combinations of planets in houses that we see in Firmicus Maternus uh, and in Dorotheus. It's, there's this one section that's in both and is, um, just a, a shockingly dense little um, a little piece of text that I've um, kind of gone back to and back to for 10 years. And so I want to share some things about that. That's kind of the one where Firmicus does almost like what are called in the Indian tradition yogas, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it was uh, it, one of my returns to that section was after having done two years of really intense, of a very intense Vedic astrology program. And then looking at that section again with those eyes and be like, Oh, there's even more here than I thought. So yeah, I'm going to so share it's some. Like, it's like what sounds like highly specific positions of like, if the native has Mars and cancer in the seventh house and Jupiter in Pisces in whatever house, then the native will be like a baker and will bake very fine breads or something like that. Yeah, uh, it, exactly. Or my my the the one delineation that got me into it was was when I was writing um, a piece on Marilyn Manson for the Mountain Astrologer in 2012, and I just looked at Firmicus and he had Saturn in the ninth in a night chart with the Moon in any way moving towards it, and he has the Moon a no in a, a waning Moon moving towards it. And so he has a waning moon applying to Saturn in the ninth house. And it said that uh, a person who has this will, um, they'll be like a long haired philosopher and interpreter of dreams. Um, and then when you get more specific, it says, and they will be hated by gods and emperors alike. Right. And I was like, oh, the, uh, the opprobrium of both moral and secular authorities. I was like, absolutely. And things have uh, come Someone to, who'd call it, name his album Antichrist Superstar, you think? Exactly. And it's Saturn in Aries in the, in the degree that is supposed to be the sun's degree of exaltation. But anyway, I was like, oh, hated by, like, I can't think of a person who's a more public symbol of that and is now for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, and so I just kept going back to this section. So that's one of my, one of my talks, um, share some stuff I've found and some extracted some principles. And then my other talk is... Um, it's an introduction to um, mantra as a form of remediation, and then like straight from um, the tradition in Vedic astrology that I've studied in, as well as an extension of those principles to other practices of recitation um, in, uh, in other uh, faiths and traditions. Like doing psalms, for example, if you're a Catholic. 
those sound like some amazing lectures. So people can see Austin in person giving a lecture. You can actually make eye contact with him and have like a mental psychic exchange in the same room, which is kind of exciting. But that'll be one way because Austin won't make eye contact with you. No, you're not. Well, you're not actually allowed to look at Austin directly in the <laughs> eyes at a conference. It, I'm like a peacock that way. <laughs> right. Um, but there's going to be, aside from Austin and other amazing astrologers, there's tons of other astrologers that are going to, I think there's over a hundred astrologers giving talks at this conference. There's going to be something at least like five lectures running concurrently four times a day. So you just have tons of, it's sort of like a podcast episode. I guess, I guess I have to actually explain that since it's been so long. Maybe there's many younger astrologers who've never attended a conference. It's like a podcast, except you're there in person and you can see the speaker and kind of enjoy the lecture live um, as you do online in the Zoom chat, but physically. Um, so there's also going to be a trade show with a lot of like different astrology booths selling different stuff. There's going to be a huge bookstore that's run by Greg Nalbandian from Astrology at All that used to be one of the biggest in-person bookstores for astrology in the country. He's going to bring all of his books here to sell them at the conference, which is one, always one of the cool things. And um, I will probably be milling about the outside of the conference, hanging out and talking to people and like picking people off periodically and taking them back here to the studio for interviews. So I'm pretty, pretty excited about it. So the conference, if you'd like to find out more information, you can go to isar2022.org and you can find out more information about all about the different packages and other things that they have available for the conference. And we'll see you, see you there. All right. So that, <laughs> that is, was really that good, is, Chris. Thank you. It's thank like you. a podcast, but you can smell Austin's pit stains. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like the deep. I can aromatic. smell them now. <laughs> <laughs> um, the peacocks will hear you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, those so big ears of theirs. So why don't we why don't we bring we've been talking about the macro of the fate of nations and world events for a little bit. Why don't why don't we draw it a little bit back in and talk about personally speaking how how individuals might experience the astrology of August. One of the things that I want to talk about that's actually one of the things that I like that's kind of a highlight of the month and one of the nice little sweet spots even during the course of the sort of tense Mars, Saturn, and Mars, Uranus stuff is Mercury's transit through the sign of Virgo um, from August 4th all the way through August 25th because it's not really afflicted and it has some nice dignity. And so I actually, Lisa and I actually ended up using this as one of our auspicious elections for the month where even though we wouldn't normally recommend starting like a major venture or undertaking under that Mars, Saturn square, we had ourselves the challenge of if you have to start something during that time frame during August, what is the best chart to use during the course of the month in order to still um, have some success uh, during the course of that? And one of the charts that we found that I wanted to highlight for this month takes place on August 13th, 2022, at about eight o'clock in the morning with mid Virgo rising. So if you use this electional chart, you'll have Virgo rising with Mercury in Virgo on the ascendant, basically rising up over the eastern horizon at that time, because you want to use set it for basically 8 o'clock local time in whatever your time is, and don't convert the time zone, because you want this election to have the ascendant in Virgo in your location. So this is a good Mercury election for all things related to Mercury. Um, it has Mercury moving swiftly, it's not afflicted, and um, is one of the few mutable planets, everything, because it puts some of the more difficult stuff off, off axis, putting Mars up in the declining house of the ninth and Saturn over in the sixth. So the moon is in Pisces and it's in the seventh. It's applying to an opposition with Mercury, which is not too bad. Um, yeah, and it would be a good chart for communication, for other mercurial type things that are more detail oriented, um, but also a little bit more practical and a little bit more grounded. Um, what do you guys use Mercury in Virgo elections for? Uh, invention, innovation, uh, um, just sort of like getting through things methodically uh, and efficiently. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really glad you built your um, monthly election around that Mercury. 
Um, because, you know, we're looking at Mercury in its rulership slash exaltation. It's not afflicted by anything. It's clear of the fixed sign mass that we just spent an hour talking about. Um, and if you think about the level of uncertainty that um, the Uran that all of this Uranus, Saturn, and Friends configuration brings, um, you know, it's during periods of uncertainty that you really need clear thinking, like clear, like, like, so what are the facts? I, you know, I've been right. uh, pummeled by 30 different people's uh, uh, interpretations uh, of the facts, but like, let's, let's go back to like, so what are the facts as we know them? What's an unknown and that I know is an unknown, right? Like that, like mental, that intellective clarity and clean um mental processing which mercury helps mercury and virgo helps facilitate is a real asset during this period and of course can be used in an um you know uh to anchor an election because it's it's literally the planet that is best off by a long shot during this period of time so i really like that you built that uh built it around mercury and mercury in virgo not only rules itself in the first but it also rules the tenth Right. So that's a really powerful pair of houses to start with. Yeah. That's a great point that it's like the person where if like a, a crisis happens and everything's suddenly gone crazy around them, Mercury and Virgo is like the person that um, keeps things together and just says, like, what is the next step and like executes, you know, what needs to be done next in order to keep things going. Yeah. 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 Like, okay. Well, we have the fresh water. Let's go get that. These roads are closed. We're going to use this road, right? Like just like that kind of it, it's you know Mercury and Virgo is like the opposite of panic thinking. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like here are the the bandages and and stuff, and let's apply that to that and do this and yeah, then move forward. So um, that is one of the electional charts we found this month. We actually found a bunch of other electional charts. Uh, we kind of overdid it this month and did a longer episode than normal in our private auspicious elections podcast, which is one of the um, benefits available to patrons that are on certain tiers when you sign up through our page on patreon.com. So if you'd like access to that episode along with all the other electional charts that we found during the course of August, then just sign up and become a patron and you'll get access to that as well as other benefits like the ability to attend live recordings of episodes like this one, where we have actually a lovely audience today who's joining us in the live chat. So thanks everyone for joining us and participating in the recording of this episode. They are looking lovely today. Definitely not <laughs> as many pe peacocks in the audience as far as I can tell, although I can't necessarily see everyone's backgrounds, but they seem uh, pretty peacocky to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, that is that let's return back to talking about August. Let's reel it in a little bit since we've talked a lot about the Mars Uranus conjunction which goes exact on the 1st we've talked about the Mars Saturn square which goes exact on the 7th um some of that is intensified a little bit later in the month it's a little weird when there's that Uranus station on the 24th but before we get there why don't we talk about our first lunation of the month which is the full moon in Aquarius on the 11th of August which actually takes place the same day that Venus ingresses into the sign of of Leo. All right, so let me show that here. Full moon. All right, so we don't have to dwell on this lunation a lot because it kind of just reactivates some of the fixed sign stuff that we've been talking about because this is a full moon in the sign of Aquarius at, it looks like, what 19 degrees of Aquarius so it's conjunct Saturn uh, after the opposition with the Sun it moves into a conjunction with Saturn three degrees later at 22 Aquarius and it's just coming out of the square with Uranus and then we'll eventually go into a square with Mars so in some ways it's kind of like bringing a spotlight to or highlighting um, some of the tensions in that whole uh, square between Taurus and Aquarius planets that we were talking about from the first week of the month, essentially, right? Yeah, it's just more, it's it's literally a giant silver spotlight on all the dynamics we've been discussing. Yeah. This this does bring to mind a previous chart I remember very well. 23 years ago, August 11th, 1999, um, there was a 
lunar eclipse, a total lunar eclipse in Aquarius, but it formed this perfect grand fixed cross, Sun and Leo, opposite Moon and Uranus in Aquarius, and Saturn was in Taurus. So there was a Saturn-Uranus square, except in, in 99 it was Saturn in Taurus and Uranus in Aquarius. And then Mars was in Scorpio, and then you had the Sun and Moon with the, the nodes in Leo Aquarius, along with Uranus and Aquarius. Um, very, very similar energy. And do you know what happened on August 11th, 1999? Mm -mm. Boris Yeltsin appointed his fifth prime minister of Russia, some unknown guy out of the KGB named Vladimir Putin, whose name we had never heard in the news until August 11th, 1999. Mm. True story, folks. I don't know. It, whatever happened to that guy? What happened to that guy? Uh, I, I think he wound up, I don't know, running some kind of robo rental thing or something. I don't know. Um, okay. Sheep farmer. But anyway, um, the important thing is... Uh, he lost his shirt on a horse. That's a good one. Um, the the important thing is when I look at those transits. In fact, a lot of the transits I'm seeing uh, this month remind me a lot of um, August of 1999, especially that eclipse. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, we we promised we were all in the macro and we were going to try and bring this in. Then I've gone and 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 then then I've gone macro on you again. But but let me try and rein this in back to the micro going to personally relate how the ascension of Vladimir Putin in 1999 is going to relate to everyone's individual lives in the next No, no, but um no, but um it's a good time to move from the what is it the FSB into office so all you FSB agents good, good time there, to move up and you know good time to um invite the boss and his wife over for dinner Yeah, metaphorically move from the shadows and uh grasp power in any way that you can and and don't hold on don't release relinquish it for the next 20 years in your personal life no but what what i would say um for those of you with long memories for those of you who remember what the summer of 99 was like for you uh there's a lot this summer that's sort of recreating that for you um and uh you know for each and every one of you listeners out there who can remember where you were in august of 99 I mean, think hard as you're going through August and, and think about what sort of parallels are, are uh, being drawn between your life today and your life way back in the 20th century. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, so Venus ingressing into Leo um, brings both a little bit of relief to Leo, but also um, it also starts moving into the... Uh, opposition with Saturn, yeah. which can be kind of yeah. a cold aspect that it'll it'll eventually culminate at some point when that goes exact by degree. Yeah, I mean that's what you know. Venus and Leo is all very nice and good for Leo, but ultimately what that means is it, it's bringing it into the opposition to Saturn, uh, the square to Uranus, and so on and so forth. It's bringing it. Yeah, it's bad for sphere. Venus. It really brings up. I mean, Leo's have had kind of a rough couple of years. I saw some discussion recently because of Saturn's transit through Aquarius. Anytime something's going through Leo, it should like otherwise be a nice, you know, little summery thing. We have the sun going through Leo, height of the su sum summer in the northern hemisphere. But then what happens is the sun runs smack dab into the opposition with Saturn, which is a bit of a cold and restrictive uh, and distance forming. Uh, sort of a combination and a, an adversity of some in some sense and that opposition between the sun and saturn goes exact around the 13th and 14th um so that's a little bit tricky in terms of um the positive side of some of the leo transits like venus going in there but also it's hard getting that uh, opposition from saturn at the same time yeah yeah and so on a kind of a simple experiential level like Chris said, you know, Venus and Leo is um, when uninterfered with is uh, almost uh, are the the like exact American cultural image of summer fun, mm -hmm. right? It's like it's hot. We're going to the beach. We're you know we're we're uh, <laughs> we're getting drunk on a boat. Um, you know, it, like we're gonna beat the heat. You know, it, it's like summer fun, right? Um, Juicy fruit commercial. You know, um, take off your shirt, show everyone that you're a skinny legend, you know, whatever. Um, but, um, but Venus, while wanting to have summer fun, um, you know, if 
um, as we say, is in the the blast zone of the the really the wake of this Mars Uranus Saturn Rahu thing. Um, and that's not gonna it's not gonna feel like it the second it moves in. If we look at um, Venus's ingress, the first little bit, it's going to be Venus applying to a trine with Jupiter. So it's going to feel like so it's going to feel like that that classical summer fun for you know um, half a week, um, week half a week. That trine is one of my favorite aspects this month. It's one of the, one of the most positive aspects is Venus uh, hitting that exact trine with Jupiter around August seventeenth, August eighteenth. Yeah, that's great. It's and then once Venus clears Jupiter, then um, then uh, then it's headed towards the the Uranus Rahu Saturn, right? Yeah. And then you know Saturn brings uh, a cold bound boundary boundedness, which is very hostile to summer fun. Um, and then you know Uranus and Taurus, like um, uh, you know there there are. Um, uh, there's maggots in the picnic basket, you know, whatever disruptions like, oh, the thing that was supposed to be Venusian and fun Taurus, the supplies, something's wrong with the supplies, right? I mean, it looks to, to me, it looks like, cause it's the sequence is the other thing we have to take into account is that on August 26th, Venus squares Uranus. And then two days later, it runs into the opposition with Saturn. So it's like, it's kind of like there's so, something fun and exciting. It's like the summer fling is the Venus square Uranus. But then a couple of days later, it's like you run into Saturn and, and suddenly things are not as exciting as they seemed, or there's a little bit of a, a problem and you have to come back down to reality. Yeah, it's like it's like the first day you're the first day you're you're kite surfing, and then the next day you've got this crazy sunburn and you've torn all your leg muscles and stuff. Yeah, it it we can just say on a general level, like it interferes with attempts at Venusian fun. Um, if you're going to have fun, especially with the Venus Saturn, serious fun, right? Like going to ISAR, right? Where you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna sit and you're going to, um, you know, be subject to esteemed minds. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, like that. That's a real suggestion, though. Esteemed minds and Austin's. Isn't this the electional chart that we actually just picked, or something close to it, for doing the next forecast episode in person? Um. Thursday. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I, I. It's like one of these two days, but basically, yeah. yeah I think what you're? Yeah, I think we were gonna do Thursday. Okay. Um. Well, so that's pretty. That's pretty good. So we got. We'll meet up, have fun, uh, but also have some serious fun, and then go. You got to go work immediately after and go give some lectures. Yeah, we were also grabbing the that last bit of uh, Mercury and Virgo. Right. That was it. Okay. Nice. Um, so yeah, so that's Venus. Venus has an interesting trip as it's going through Leo this month. Um, one of the more positive configurations is just that trine with Jupiter, as we said, around the 17th or 18th. Things get a little exciting um, by the 25th, 26th when it squares Uranus, but then there's a little bit of a downer on the 28th. And I, I would also just add that with the configuration with Uranus and Saturn, like sure, there you know there are some of the challenges we mentioned, but Mars is gone. Mars is no yeah. longer inflaming that, and that's um, that's that 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 takes the ambient suck levels down considerably. For sure, yeah, because Mars is just pouring gasoline on the Saturn Uranus square up to that point, but it um, departs from the fixed signs and leaves by August nineteenth, uh, August twentieth. Mars ingresses into Gemini, and then we have some sort of relief uh, from the inflammation that Mars was bringing to Taurus and to the fixed signs in general at that point. Yeah, you know, I um, I, I I looked at Mars Mars's entire cycle in Gemini with some level of trepidation or foreboding. Um, you know, like one, I don't love Mars retrogrades. Two, there's the configuration with the U.S. chart. Um, <laughs> three, I'm not looking forward to Mars in Gemini with my moon forever. You know, it's going to be, so Mars is going to enter Gemini this month and will leave Gemini at the very end of March next year. Wow. So literally this plays a Mars and Gemini plays us out of Saturn and Aquarius. By the time Mars leaves Gemini, Saturn will have been in Pisces for several weeks. But that said, you know, I had all this in my mind. And then I was like, oh no, Mars moves into Gemini. I was like, oh, the trouble doesn't start for a while. We've got 
Um, we don't have the retrograde station until the end of October. Um, this first part is one, it's going to feel really good to have Mars not in a fixed sign, like you were just saying. Um, and two, we've I'm, got I'm like a fan a Mars, of that as a fixed sign person. I'm, I'm yeah. a big fan of that. Right. And we've got a Mars Jupiter sextile, like Mars is going to cause trouble, no doubt, but that's, that's later, right? Like we don't have to do that. Um, we don't have to do that at the end of August. It's going, it's going to feel like a relief as far as Mars is concerned at the end of August. I mean, it definitely will feel like a relief and a release of tension because that's one of the biggest like keywords that we really discovered definitely in 2020 is tension and like, you know, pressing the gas pedal and the brake pedal at the same time and other metaphors of almost being pulled in two different directions that really come up with Mars and Saturn. Um, because Mars wants to move forward at a high rate of speed and Saturn wants to hold things back and not move at all. Um, so having a, a release from that tension will be really good. I do think that though that Mars moving into Gemini that you'll that individuals should start paying attention to as soon as that ingress takes place, um, the shift in the activation of certain topics in their chart, because Mars is going to spend the next several months in that same sign and in that same whole sign house, that sometimes as soon as the ingress takes place, that some of the events and circumstances that will really come to a head when Mars stations retrograde in October and then begins its retrograde cycle, some of that stuff really starts to manifest or, or starts to at least be put in place as soon as Mars goes into that sign. Um, so it will be important to pay attention to that shift when Mars goes into Gemini, August 19th and 20th. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, let me repeat something that, uh, I pointed out back in 2016 when the three of us met to talk about Mars retrogrades. That was the last episode the three of us did together, the, right? The last episode three of us did together, I think in March of 2016. Um, when it comes to the U S and things being a bit volatile, um, Historically, uh, Mars typically gets if uh, if the U.S. gets attacked, it's usually after Mars has made a direct station within a, like a month or so after a direct station. So that includes Pearl Harbor, nine eleven. I think there's some other examples in there, but those are obviously two of the better ones. Um, so yeah, after a after a Mars direct station, that is when the U.S. seems to be most vulnerable to some kind of attack. Um, taking it out of a mundane context and the impending like doom in terms of <laughs> that, like let's talk a little bit about Mars retrograde since this is it's not going to start yet, but this is the initial sort of inkling of Mars heading into that. Um, on a personal level, Nick, you know, how do you interpret Mars retrogrades, or how does that manifest in the lives of individuals? On the whole, just on their own, they really seem to get things moving in that sign. They're not. Uh, on mm -hmm. their own sort of malefic, even though it's a malefic planet. Um, That's a good point. Getting things moving, starting movement and, and quickness, it speeds things up in that sign. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, particularly if things have been moving slowly up until that point. Um, but yeah, if you have a rising sign, Gemini, or... Um, the sun in Gemini, you know, the, that Mars transit or Saturn in Gemini, that Mars retrograde transit can really come along. And Gemini is already kind of a, a quick sign in and of itself. So that's actually important symbolically when we're combining two different uh, astrological in indications that both indicate a sort of quickness. Yeah. Yeah, sure. But, um, you know, uh, things are never quick enough for Gemini. So that's when, you know, a transit like this comes along and, and helps things move things along. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, typically, you know, un unless it's doing something, unless it's making some really ugly aspect, it's typically positive for individual people. Um, you know, when, when it, when it's hitting those, those angular houses or the lights or something. What are some of your keywords for Mars and Gemini, Austin? Oh, Mars and Gemini. Um, let's see. Some of the, I think of one of the one of the issues with Mars and Gemini that's a result of that tremendous capacity for movement is that um, both with the na both with the natives as well as as a transit, um, it can really lead to people being their attention and energies being frayed by um, 
trying to accomplish too many things at once or trying to take too many positions. Um, there's a, it's something that I would watch for this, what, eight months uh, of Mars and Gemini um, is splitting yourself and splitting your attention and energy too many times. Cause that, you know, one of the things that Mars brings as a result of pushing for work in action is exhaustion um, and a, a, like being totally out of resources because, you know, you're burning, you know, it's uh, you, when you're hitting the gas pedal all the time, what happens? Right. You run out of gas. Um, so that's an issue. Um, you know, it's in a mercurial sign. And so we're really looking at um, Mercury Mars combination type thinking where, you know, it, it's the, as should we say, the Mercury Mars gives us um, lawyers, engineers, liars. Um, it can be verbal assault, but it can also just be the verbal thrust and parry. Um, you know, we talked about this in the yearly with Lisa, Chris, you know, um, it certainly um, smells like cyber warfare, um, whatever the next level of that is, like, how could it not be? I was just thinking of that because a famous Mars and Gemini with also the ascendant and Mercury and sun there in North Node is Edward Snowden. So, ha you know, hackers, basically. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, like um, aggressive uh, contests um, and actions. Uh, on Very that, competitive, like, I'd say. What? Very competitive. Yeah, 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 Mercury yeah. And Mars, yeah. Right, because Mer Mercury likes to play games, and putting Mars there, I, I can understand how that would bring a competitive edge. Yeah, Mars isn't the one who says, "I'll race you to the corner." That's Mercury. Right, Mars, um, Mars ups the stakes, though. <laughs> Yeah, um, but, yeah. Go ahead. I was just gonna say the one with the inclination to say, "I'll get to the corner before you do." That's that's Mercury, right? Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, and I, I, yeah. You can also just think of the a lot of nature's creatures do a predator prey thing, where Mars says, "I'm going to eat you," and Mercury says, "I could run away from you if you can catch me." Um, but yeah, it's you know, like the you know the the focus of you know, if we're talking about competitive games or contests, um, you know, like speed, agility, the ability to change direction, um, you know, in uh, warfare or combat, we're looking at the capacity for uh, deception and trickery, right? It's not that my army is stronger than yours. It's that I, I fooled you. And so my weaker army beats your larger army, right? Like we really see a focus on tactics, uh, tactics and deception rather than just brute force, uh, or, you know, it's not, yeah, it's tactical rather than, um, and if we're thinking of Mars as like heroic, it's, it's not Hercules. Um, it's the trickster hero, right? It's the solving, uh, solving problems, uh, through, through use of the intellect rather than, um, through being able to swing a really heavy club. It's funny that you mentioned the tactical thing. It reminds me, 79 years ago, which is a, a near-perfect Mars synodic return, uh, 79 years ago in 1943, during the Mars retrograde in Gemini, um, right in the middle of that Mars retrograde was when FDR, Stalin, and Churchill met up in Tehran and basically put in the plan to do the D-Day invasion. So talk about tactical planning. Well, and there was so much trickery. They were like, you know, because if if the Germans knew where the attack was going to happen and when it was going to happen, it was almost certainly going to be a failure. So they planned dozens of um, false. Uh, they planned dozens of of not real invasions, right? Um, to in order disguise. to throw them off. Yeah. And didn't Churchill have Mars retrograde in Gemini in the tenth? Did Churchill have not Churchill? Uh, FDR. Sorry. Uh, FDR did. FDR yeah, did. Yeah, that's yes. what I meant. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. He was he was born actually very close to the station, as I recall. Uh, but yes, he did have Mars retrograde in Gemini. Um, it's funny actually. He and Lincoln, both Aquarians. Lincoln was born with Mars stationing retrograde, I think, in Libra or Scorpio, and Roosevelt was born with Mars. Yeah, only uh, very very soon going direct in Gemini. Uh, but yeah, both both Lincoln and and Roosevelt are born, both both born close to Mars stations. Yeah, you can see it's three days. It's three days away from 
um, stationing direct, if I'm not mistaken. That's not 27, right? That's 2.7? Yeah, 2.7. Yeah, so it's three days before stationing direct. And, and Lincoln, Lincoln's similar, but on the other end of the retrograde. It's, mm. it's just going retrograde in his. I always think about that with FDR's chart um, because of having like Mars in the 10th house in the place of like one's career and one's destiny in some sense and how his life really culminated and everything built up to that he was the guy in charge that had to lead the United States through World War II. And that's a really difficult position to be in. And then he basically successfully led the country through World War II and then promptly died basically like right as the war was ending. Yeah. And talk about tactical thinking. Um, you know, there's this great quote from FDR um, that his left hand didn't know what his right hand was doing. It's either, either he said that about himself or someone said it about him, but um, he was really, really good at, um, you know, playing both sides of the ballpark, if you will, like, like, you know, very, very tactical thinker, really good at making everyone think that he's on their side, even when he's, um, you know, not. <laughs> Ooh, Catherine Tom Thompson in the chat mentions FDR's fireside chats as a Mars and Gemini vibe. That's a really good point. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, the first, the first one to make that kind of communication uh, with the public. I mean, people hadn't really heard a president speak to them before. Uh, it's kind of hard to fathom how strange and new and unique that was. Right. As I'm looking through my files, another funny. Mars and Gemini in the 10th house with Virgo rising is Steve Carell, um, who it's kind of funny because he made his, you know, he became the most famous. I, I feel like he's still the most famous for um, playing the character of Michael Scott on The Office. And the entire thing is just, you know, him making verbal gaffes and really cringy jokes. But that's like the focal point. He's like so good at doing it that it's entertaining and they did it for like many seasons and that's sort of how he became as famous as he is today was by getting that character and um i was watching recently on youtube like a clip of other people that did interviews for that role and there were some like famous actors that did interviews for it but like none of them were good for it even though they were good actors and then all of a sudden at the very end of the clip you see him take that role and just like right away he had it just immediately and he knew what the character was supposed to be and it was this guy that was just making these terrible verbal gaffes and um communicating and saying things that were just super awkward and off-putting but in a hilarious and, and almost endearing way mm. that's my that's my mars and gemini image and image for people that's great uh well and, and part you know and part of it was that um, the character of Michael Scott was constantly offending everybody, right? Um, without but, but really like accidentally, it. yeah, yeah, inadvertently. So one thing I would say, just to add to this, um, is sort of you know getting to know Mars and Gemini because Mars and Gemini is going to be riding shotgun for a long time, um, you know, and it's it's so much it's uh, uh, it pays such dividends to observe Mars once it enters the sign where it's going to go retrograde before rather than waiting until there are active problems there months and months later. I don't know. You, you may not need to start the second it moves in, um, but you know, um, before the, you know, before the whatever crisis point, but as in terms of sort of um, on an elemental level, <clears throat> whatever house Gemini is and whatever planets reside there, there's just going to be a lot of ambient heat there social heat internal heat whatever whatever the how wherever the house locates that heat um and you know having the uh making making sure to properly hydrate that area right to like just know that there's you know there's there's gasoline there's just going to be gasoline there um and to to think about that and to you know if it's bodily um you know you want to be doing anti-inflammatory things or cooling things you know etc cetera, etc cetera. if it's social you just want to be aware of that and not be like now's a great time to i don't know you know do my michael scott impression but whatever it is <laughs> but just man getting a sense of that heat and then thinking about um how to how to have management systems in place right make sure that there's enough coolant in the engine because it's going to be running hot for a while again tactical thinking 
another good keyword that we've come up with Mars before was like a spiciness that whatever house Mars is going into in your chart, once it moves into Gemini, it's going to bring some some spice and as Austin was saying, some heat to that area. But sometimes spicy can be good. It can like change things up. Um, it can make things move faster. But sometimes a spice in excess can be like a burning and can go too far so that it makes things a little uncomfortable in that area of life. But in just the right amounts, it can actually be something that you know adds variety and adds a sort of interestingness to the flavor of that house for you because it's bringing additional activity and energy and heat. Um, so sometimes heat can be good. Also, another keyword is it's just going to speed things up in that area of your life, probably in whatever house it ingresses into. And that's one of the things that's going to be important to pay attention to in August as soon as Mars, Mars moves into Gemini is if things start to speed up in that house or that sector of your chart and that area of your life, because then what's going to happen later on is that by October, Mars is going to slow down suddenly and grind to a halt. So then all of a sudden you may see a slowdown and more of a focusing and more of a slow kind of plodding or grinding quality in that area of your life for some reason. But you'll be able to anticipate what that's going to be if you pay attention to what starts happening after the ingress. Yeah, we can. Uh, you could also look at the path as have as sort of holding a hairpin curve up ahead, right? And so you don't want to assume that it's a straight shot from here to there, right? Right. Um, Even though the, you know, that might look like it initially, right? Like if you look at the Mars retrogrades, it's it's a loop de loop, right? Um, you know, it's a squiggly path, and that's part of retrogrades in general, especially Mercury, Mars, Venus retrogrades is often the way through is more complicated and twisty and turny. Um, the road might eventually get you north, but it turned west and now you're going south. It is this really going to take us north. Um, and so to be prepared for a more uh, circumambulatory um, piece or, you know, maze-like portion uh, of whatever Mars journey is, uh, in my experience, good practice. Also, Chris, with uh, with your mention of spice, it made me think of you know with us looking at just the first ingress and even the retrograde station is months away. It made me think of the show Hot Ones. I don't know if you've yeah. seen that series, it's an interview show where they're like pro the guests are fed progressively spicier wings. Where the first couple, it's like, mm, that's got some that's you know that's got some zest, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then by like, right? And they're like, oh, that's tasty. Yeah. And then, you know, you have people like just streaming tears um, and sometimes bear, sometimes in a, in a pained psychedelic state by the time they get to the eighth or the ninth wing. Yeah. By the end, cause it gets progressively hotter and hotter and you go up like 10 different levels of heat. That's kind of what we're going to be doing here as we get up to the Mars retrograde is like, it starts off in August is like, Oh, that's a little spicy, but that's tasty. You know, as Mars dips into that sign, but then all of a sudden, like September, October, you're like this, is this getting hotter? Is this just me? And then all of a sudden, it's like burn, burning your mouth by the time you get to October and November. And yeah, and part of, yeah, that's too many Scovilles. Um, right. And that is, you know, part of the, the astronomy, uh, the visible astronomy of, of Mars retrograde is it is as close and as bright as Mars gets to the Earth, right? So, and, and it's visible for longer and longer portions of the night, Right. So it's just brighter and closer and brighter and closer, increasing the, you know, the, the site, the astral Scovilles. That's, that's the big thing is it's, it's there. It's in your face all that time. Um, you know, as opposed to being hidden. Uh, I think that's the, the distinguishing factor for Mars. Um, I love Hot Ones. I've been watching that since the beginning, and somebody recently suggested to me, and I thought this was kind of a good idea, was to do like an astrology version of that with n the next time I have somebody out in person, and to have like a set of like hot wings with like progressively hotter things, but then ask them astrology questions or like questions about their chart or something like that, and just because what it does is uh, in the interviews on Hot Ones is it kind of removes people's ability to do like packaged you know pr responses and they just like say whatever the actual like sort of truth is it brings out the truth a little bit by adding a sort of sense of heat and like direness to like what's going on so it makes for a more interesting interview yeah my new movie actually sucks i really had a miserable time making it <laughs> right <laughs> so so austin you're you're committed to that for when you fly out here in august sure 
Sure. Okay. <laughs> you you and you and Caitlin, like we might have to. Uh, I I would do that. I would actually totally do that if we were recording after I give my lectures at the conference. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I don't I don't I don't want to subject myself or my audience to the intestinal revolt that will inevitably happen if that occurs. Right. Yeah. That makes a little bit of sense. So you're welcome yeah, audience. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, so the only other thing is it was funny. YouTube recently launched a, um, like in in-house, like tarot reading service, which I was really surprised that YouTube did that. And they took a bunch of famous like YouTube creators and used um, thematically appropriate ones and put them on different tarot cards. And one of them was actually Sean Evans from Hot Ones that they put on the sun. Um, so that's like a tar tarot card where it's like Sean Evans and it says accomplishment, enlightenment, vitality, and it's the sun. And he's got the sun behind him with the rays and the fire sort of coming up from, from Hot Ones. How do, you, how do you feel about that? Would you use that tarot deck, Austin? I would put uh, Hot Ones as the tower because that's it's the, the whole point is to like break people down yeah okay that's good um all right that's actually a really good point constance wallace points out that hot spicy doesn't register in the taste buds it registers in the pain center that actually makes me think of it's like there's some people that just have a different inborn tolerance for heat and some people like really like hot and spicy things and other people just like can't take it at all or it, it hits them differently. And it makes me think of Mars placements and how, you know, sometimes if somebody has a prominent Mars placement that they just have a more fiery personality or sometimes are more attracted to like fiery things and it suits them in different ways versus others that that energy is like harder to deal with. Um, that's kind of an interesting thing to keep in mind as we're talking about this Mars ingress into Gemini and, and the energy that it's going to import into Gemini. And some people are going to like that. They're going to like the spiciness and be able to deal with it and actually enjoy how it quickens the pace of things in that area. Whereas there's others where it might be too much, it might be too fiery, or it might make things go too fast so that they really want it to slow down a little bit more. Yeah, that, that's actually a great analogy. Like people definitely have. It's like the amount of, you know, if you uh, like with competitive dynamics, um, you know, you see some people like everybody has like the level of competition that feels good. And more than that is always a problem. Right. And less than that might be boring. Right. Um, Cause right. you know, some people just like cooperative games. Some people like slightly competitive games. Some people like chess where it's like there, there can be only one winner, right? There's no second place in chess, uh, or in, you know, cage fighting. Um, but it, it's, and it's very much a matter of taste, uh, or in, in personal con in personal relationships, like some people are just like totally cool with, um, you know, uh, some people might characterize a level of conflict as passionate and other people will be like, I could never live like that. You know, how much, how much peace do you need versus how much, um, you know, how much friction do you hunger for? Yeah. And for some people, like a, a level of friction being like necessary versus others, a level of friction being off putting or repelling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's, yeah, that's a hundred percent a personal setting. So one thing I'd like to point out is that the two of the themes that are two big or two of our biggest things this month, which is the, um, Mar, excuse me, Saturn, Uranus, um, Rahu or North node thing and the Mars at the very beginning of the sign in which it will eventually go retrograde. Those two both hit big in early November, right? So mm. when we're looking at like, okay, once Mars is actually retrograde and we're, you know, the, we're, we've gotten to the ninth wing, right? The ninth wing is delivered, um, basically right when the next set of eclipses, on on uranus and and pinging saturn uh, occur right so mm -hmm. that that's our next sort of whatever that that that's the next it's interesting because it's not mars in the middle of the saturn uranus thing the saturn uranus eclipse thing but it's it's happening at the same time and i would say just on a simple planning level like i don't know the first two three like first two weeks of august is about as chaotic as it gets until we get to end of October, 
um, and then in, and then I don't know, let's say first half of November. The ambient, our baseline level of chaos these days is much higher than in the past. But as far as like the spikes, we're doing a spike right now, and then that's absolutely another spike. And that we see the very beginnings of that at the end of this month. Right. Um, so getting to the last week of the month, um, so we mentioned Mars going into Gemini on the 20th, the sun goes into Virgo. So we have the end of Leo season and the beginning of Virgo season on the 22nd. Uranus stations retrograde in Taurus on the 24th, which is actually really important because that puts sort of an exclamation mark next to Uranus at that point in the month, even though Mars has moved out of that. We're moving away from some of the, the tenseness of the configuration. Um, you're still going to see an intensification of some of those Uranus significations when it stations. And I believe, if I'm remembering correct, correctly, wasn't one of the, that one of the primary signatures when there was like that disastrously chaotic pullout of the US from Afghanistan last year? Wasn't that the ra- around the time of the Uranus station in Taurus? Was it in August? I don't know if I it was in so, August, yeah. but it was around the time of the it station. Would have been August. Yeah, and that and that begins. So now um you're yeah, so yeah. Um I'm not mentioning that necessarily as a mundane thing to talk about the US again, but more just that um people sometimes don't know how, what to do with stations or don't give them as n- enough importance in the way that they can really um magnify whatever a planet is doing as it's moving through that sign. It does it much more prominently and much more intensely when the planet is also stationing either retrograde or direct. Yeah, well, and and that's you know it leads into our Saturn Saturn Uranus not exa- not making a perfect mathematical aspect, but being within a degree. Like that's 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 what's between now and the November chaos spike. I'm going to call that a chaos plateau. That holding at uh, eighteen that's coming up. Hmm. I like that. I like that. Um, <laughs> the chaos, where the uh, what are the Lovecraftian beings? The 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 chaos plateau of Lang. Anyway, um, the last thing I want to talk about here, because it takes place towards the very end of the month, is the new moon in the sign of Virgo, which takes place on the twenty seventh of August. Yeah, give so, it to me. Let me pull up the chart for that. But I didn't mean give me the chart. I meant um, <laughs> I'm excited. I'm excited to have uh, a new moon that's not in a fixed sign. Like let's let's you know let's get some of that mutable energy. That's like yeah. Uh, although it is square Mars. Yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I was I'm gonna say trying to, trying to find the silver lining. You really are Mister Silver Silver Lining these days, Austin. It's well, funny. you know. Yeah, it's the peacocks. It's the brightening. Of it's the, the peacocks. Yeah. So there it is. Uh, it's early. Looks like here in Denver, it's early on the morning of the twenty seventh, or late at night, depending on your perspective. But it's at four degrees of Virgo. Uh, Mars, as you've both pointed out, is at four degrees of Gemini at the same time, squaring that. Um, other configurations going on. Venus is just barely coming off of that square with Uranus and heading into about a degree and a half or so away from the opposition with Saturn. Um, Mercury, interestingly, even though the new moon is in Virgo, Mercury has just departed from Virgo and has moved into the sign of Libra. And it's actually only about two weeks. It's 13 days away from stationing retrograde in the sign of Libra. Uh, and that's one of the major things that we'll have to talk about when we get to September uh, is that Mercury retrograde in Libra. Yep. So making an opposition to Jupiter. I'll take it. Yeah. And a trine with mars which is actually kind of nice that's true um, yeah in terms of uh, increased fluidity of communication forthrightness of communication saying what needs to be said in a direct and effective manner yeah well you know um that mercury jupiter is how should we say provides some nice capacity to manage whatever mars is putting out and you know, Chris, as you you said, or we've told you said, and then I said, uh, we've been talking about getting to know Mars and Gemini um, mm-hmm. in this lead up period, and you know, a new moon exactly configured to it, but with like you know, really some help from Mercury and Jupiter um, in understanding it and kind of figuring out what are the positive, what angles can it be worked um, by, et cetera, et cetera. 
Like mm-hmm. that's a really great configuration for like, uh, for, you know, looking at and feeling the Mars retrograde and, you know, getting, getting, getting an early read on it, getting some Intel so you can, mm-hmm. you know, figure out how much is this going to need to be managed? Um, if so, in what ways? Right. That makes sense. Um, Mercury and Libra, what are very quickly do either of you have any famous like Mercury and Libra examples that you think of when you think of that sign or that combination placement? Uh, <clears throat> um, I think so. I want to double check though. Well, I mean, so I mean, Mercury, my, Jupiter, my favorite in general, ones go ahead. The one I always think of is like T.S. Eliot, who had Mercury conjunct Venus on the ascendant oh, yeah. in Libra in in their birth chart. So a famous poet, for example, is a very good you know Mercury and Libra manifestation. So le- less Mercury in Libra, but more just Mercury opposite Jupiter. Mercury opposite Jupiter is like smooth and diplomatic, um, and often uh, <coughs> has some gift for oratory. Um, you know, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln had Mercury Jupiter configuration. Um, Barack Obama has the opposition in the first and seventh. It's the like, okay, well, let's all think about this, right? Like, you know, there, there's a smoothness and a, a largeness to the perspective that's also diplomatic. And I would say that diplomatic quality will be um, <coughs> that when I think of Mercury in Libra, the first thing I think of is the diplomacy. That's a really good one because that immediately brings to mind um, Eleanor Roosevelt, who had Mer- Mercury uh, Mercury at two degrees of Libra conjunct the midheaven in the eleventh whole sign house, um, and I believe she became like once the United Nations was set up, became like the first U.S. representative to the United Nations or first diplomat or something like that, didn't she? Yeah, um, she wasn't. It's not like the Secretary General or whatever, but it's yeah. Um, the head of the Human Rights Commission or something to that level. She had a big, big level position there for sure. Yeah, she became a diplomat basically, which is like exactly what Austin was saying in a, in a very literal sense of being good at, at diplomacy. Yeah. Someone who reminds me, someone who had Mercury and Libra opposite Jupiter and Aries is someone who left us not long ago is the comedian Norm MacDonald. Mm. Who is a decidedly <laughs> diplomatic person, but really diplomatic about how he's undiplomatic i don't if that makes any well, there, sense there's a uh, there's a, it absolutely requires a certain genius to be perfectly rude yeah right uh, i was watching i watched the beavis and butthead movie last night and i was like oh they're perfectly stupid right yeah. like it takes a genius <laughs> to write this level like this level of stupidity i think the same thing applies to politeness and rudeness yeah, no, Norm MacDonald had a had a talent for being rude, but a Mercury Libra kind of rude. Um, uh, do we have a birth time for him? I don't know that we do. Yeah, I guess not. It's not I think he up. was born in Quebec City, but he's got the opposition, and that's that's the point I'm making. Yeah, yeah. So he, it looks like he was a sun moon in Libra with Mercury in Libra opposite to Jupiter. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah, I like that. Um, cause he sometimes was good at doing that and playing the oppositional, like oppositional or adversarial role of like the other side of like, if you're supposed to do this and this is the social convention, but then like doing the opposite of that yeah, um, and going the other direction was like part of his thing that he was really good at. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, Austin's right. Just being really rude, but with this big smile in a way that could get you in on his rudeness, you know, like, a. uh, yeah. Yeah. There's a hilarious, um, like the YouTube, first YouTube, like awards ceremony or something that they tried to do really early on in like 2010 or something like that. And they, for some reason, they picked him as the host and he just like showed up in like sweats and like did not care at all about <laughs> what was happening. And he just like, he was, there were two other YouTubers that had to co host it with them. And he was just like constantly like making fun of them and making fun of like, the guests like sometimes like guests like these guys from the lonely island came on and he insulted them like immediately at the very beginning <laughs> and uh yeah it's really funny people should look it up for an example of what what you two are talking about when it comes to norm 
I, I'm thinking to an episode of Conan O'Brien years ago where he was on next to an actress whose name I forget, but she was promoting some movie and he's just saying the worst things about the movie. <laughs> and like, oh yeah, it was Courtney, Thor- Courtney Thorne Smith and it was on the yeah Conan O'Brien. Right. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, it was something like Board of Education and he said Board, B-O-R-E-D. Yeah. He's heckling her like there while she's trying to promote her movie. It's very funny stuff. Well, and sometimes that oppositional role worked against him because I think he famously, like Savage, he had this amazing um, spot on Saturday Night Live where he did the news segment in the 1990s, which he kind of pioneered. But then he would just like um, savagely critique and attack uh, O.J. Simpson, and like one of the producers of SNL, I think, was a friend of O.J. Yeah. Simpson, and they so told, he fired they told, him. Yeah. yeah, so he got fired for playing that role, basically, and saying some of those things. So it's an interesting other side of that in terms of uh, some of the Mercury and Libra or Mercury opposite Jupiter things we're talking about. Right. But in some ways getting fired kind of helped him out because he had everyone else on his side and, you know, he rebounded quite quickly. So yeah. Anyway, uh, he had Mercury and Libra opposite Jupiter and Aries. So there you go. All right. Well, those are two really good examples and we'll just get the very tail end or very beginning of that transit at the very start of August. So that's something we'll have to revisit next month since we're going to have that Mercury retrograde in the sign of Libra in September. Um, are there any other major things that we haven't touched on or talked about when it comes to the astrology of, of August or anything that we're going to be kicking ourselves or not mentioning if we don't before we wrap up? I don't think so. I, I just want to uh, restate, I think, Austin's point about when Venus comes into the opposition with Saturn and is square Uranus, that it's time for serious fun, which means get your butts over to Esar and go see Austin's talks and enjoy yourselves. Yeah, or somebody more serious than me. <laughs> yeah, well, I think there's going to be 100 speakers, so I think people have plenty of selection to, to choose from. Yeah, someone with an angular Saturn. Most of those right. 100 people are more serious than Austin. <laughs> um all right all right guys well this has been fun this has been a lot of fun thanks for joining us for this today, yeah it's nick. been awesome thanks for coming nick it's thanks, funny guys. having you on we get into like a long like hour long geopolitics like discussion and historical events and like, i think w- who knew that would happen with me coming in yeah exactly the fall although weirdly and i'm a little disappointed that venus retrograde wasn't mentioned even once i don't think so i feel like you're kind of it doesn't go retrograde in august okay that's it amazingly yeah. all right in fact it doesn't go retrograde for another year so we're safe for now yeah uh i guess we did talk about the mars retrograde and the last time that happened was in there 2020 you go. snuck so there it go. in you got a snuck retrograde in. in nice yep. All right. where can people find out more information about you and your work and what do you have coming up or what are you working on nick I am at nickdaganbestastrologer.com. Uh, I'm doing consultations regularly. Uh, I'm working on both a video project and a writing project, both of which I'm taking my sweet time with. Um, but um, yeah, I'll have more about, to say about them when, when they're closer to being ready. But uh, yeah, uh, come see me at nickdaganbestastrologer.com and uh, book a session if you're interested. Nice. I'll put a link to that uh, in the description below this video on YouTube or on the Astrology Podcast website entry for this episode. Austin, what do you have coming up aside from coming out here to Denver to hang out with me and go to the conference? Well, so that's my main thing. Um, The other big thing is that Sphere and Sunder will be releasing a Venus and Pisces series um, uh, let's say probably third week of the month, middle of the month. Um, and it's a beautiful Venus and Pisces election. It's actually, it was actually done on the same day as the moon and cancer, which was, um, released last month. It was a moon, moon and cancer trying Venus and Pisces. Beautiful. The moon is angular for the moon one. And then Venus is angular and in the planetary hour for the Venus one. So it's the, the perfect companion piece. Um, I like it a lot. I have a stone uh, that I did during that period of time that makes me 
see the uh, the bright side of history. <laughs> That's <laughs> it helps what it is. me be uh, less perfectly rude. N- now I understand. It's the you did you got some talisman. Moon, cancer talismans going on, and that's what's softening you up. That's right, making me less of an asshole. It literally turned his wallpaper into peacock. That's right, <laughs> right. It's, it's a very Venusian like color scheme. The pastels. All right. Well, if I get one of those, and then you see a bunch of colorful birds in the background behind me, then we know it's work. It's working. I just can't wait to see how the kids dress up as Austin this coming Halloween. That's that's what I'm looking forward to. Oh yeah, I showed Nick the the people that dressed up as me and Jessica Lignato like a couple years ago at a Halloween party for astrologers. It was pretty impressive. Oh uh, well, the fact that I have absolutely no style makes that difficult. <laughs> no, there's there's this one woman on Twitter that just did the best do- imitation of you I've ever seen. It was amazing. Oh the yeah, the verbal impression was really good. Yeah, yeah, that was good. Um, all right, what are your websites again, Austin? So the uh, the Venus and Pisces series will release at spherensundry.com. And um, you can come check out my website at austincopic.com. Not a lot happening this month. I'd go to Sphere and Sundry instead. But in the future, I'm at austincopic.com. Cool. All right. As for myself, I'm going to keep doing the podcast. That's my main thing at this point. And uh, yeah, if you like the podcast and you enjoy what's essentially become a series of free classes, uh, consider signing up for my page on patreon.com and shooting me a few bucks each month to help support the production of the episodes. What I'm going to focus on now is like I did with Nick is, you know, focusing on bringing more people out here to have those conversations in person because it allows me to record a bunch of episodes back to back, but also to have more genuine discussions and like back and forth. Uh, not that this isn't that, but it's just so much different having people in person in the studio. And I'm pretty excited after this visit with Nick about the potential for that in the future and doing more of that as we move into things. So uh, that's my plan, I think, in terms of this month and in terms of the future. So with that said, that is the end of this episode of the Astrology Podcast. So thanks everyone for joining me. Thank you both. Uh, Thanks to our live audience who joined us in the live chat. And I guess that's it for this episode. So we'll see you again next time. Good luck in August. And uh, we'll see you again in September. All right. Take care, everyone. Special thanks to all the patrons that helped to support the production of this episode of the podcast through our page on patreon.com. In particular, shout out to the patrons on our producers tier, including Thomas Miller, Catherine Conroy, Christy Moe, Ariana Amour, Mandy Ray, Angelique Nambo, Issa Sabah, and Jake Otero. If you like the work that I'm doing here on the podcast and you would like to find a way to support it, then please consider becoming a patron through my page on patreon.com. And in exchange, you'll get access to bonus content such as early access to new episodes, the ability to attend the live recording of the month ahead forecast each month, access to a private monthly auspicious elections report that we put out each month, access to exclusive episodes that are only available for patrons, or you can also get your name listed in the credits at the end of each episode. For more information, go to patreon.com slash astrology podcast. The main software we use here on the podcast to look at astrological charts is called Solar Fire for Windows, which is available at alabe.com, and you can use the promo code AP15 to get a 15% discount. For Mac users, we use a similar set of software by the same programming team called AstroGold for Mac OS, which is available from astrogold.io, and you can use the promo code ASTROPODCAST15 to get a 15% discount on that as well. If you would like to learn more about the approach to astrology that I outline on the podcast, then you should check out my book titled Hellenistic Astrology, The Study of Fate and Fortune where I traced the origins of Western astrology and reconstructed the original system that was developed about 2,000 years ago. And in this book, I outline basic concepts, but also take you into intermediate and advanced techniques for reading a birth chart, including some timing techniques. So you can find out more about the book at hellenisticastrology.com slash book. The book pairs very well with my online course on ancient astrology called the Hellenistic Astrology Course, which has over 100 hours of video lectures where I go into detail about teaching you how to read a birth chart and showing hundreds of example charts in order to really demonstrate how the techniques work in practice. So find out more information about that at theastrologyschool.com. And finally, special thanks to our sponsors, including The Mountain Astrologer magazine, which is available at mountainastrologer.com, 
the Honeycomb Collective Personal Astrological Almanacs, available at honeycomb.co, and the AstroGold Astrology app, which is available for iPhone and Android. You can find out more information about that at astrogold.io. There's also a major astrology conference happening this year that's being hosted by the International Society for Astrological Research, and that's happening August 25th through the 29th, 2022 in Westminster, Colorado. You can find out more information at isar2022.org. Thank you.